I have done one virtual Skywarn class before this, so I didn't update that. So my apologies, but this is the second one we've, we've ever done virtually. So uh, hopefully all the media plays well. Um, I think Zoom is going to be a better uh, media platform than uh, Join Me, which is what we use for the for the other uh, virtual conference we had. They had a lot of problems with the video, so hopefully it, it works better here because this presentation is a lot cooler with the videos. <laughs> Uh, we do have, uh, if you're interested in signing up to be a voluntary storm spotter with us, uh, you can look on our webpage. Uh, there, there's a link up at the top, uh, or there's this uh, short URL uh, down here. Uh, basically, our voluntary storm spotters, uh, we're just asking for your name, uh, contact information, and location so that we can, you know, you. Put, you, put that information into Google Maps and make you a dot on our radar map. Uh, and so if what we do with our dots on the radar map is if we see a dangerous storm approach your dot, all this form says is that uh, we can call you and say, hey, what's that storm look like? Or once the storm passed uh, is past you, we can say, hey, what did that storm do? Uh, and, and that's it. So if you ever wanted to be a dot on the Weather Service radar map, man, here's your chance. <laughs> uh, it's not mandatory for this class at all, uh, but just if something if you want to do it, uh, uh, you know, it does help us out and help us find out what's actually going on with the storms uh, because we don't know. We see stuff on radar, but we don't know for sure what's hitting the ground until somebody tells us. So the, uh, the state of Arkansas uh, is covered by five National Weather Service offices. Uh, our office is out of North Little Rock at the North Little Rock Airport, and uh, we issue warnings and forecasts for all of those counties uh, shaded in blue. Um, uh, Memphis is basically off to the east. Uh, they're in purple. Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma is the yellow in the northwest. Uh, Shreveport, Louisiana covers the southwest, and then those two counties in the far southeast are covered by Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and the reason why Arkansas is carved up this way uh, is because it's based on who has the closest radar coverage uh, to their respective county. So uh, that's basically why Arkansas is uh, divvied up that way. For instance, Memphis uh, has the closest radar for eastern Arkansas, so that's why they, you know, get those eastern rows of counties. Um, but at any rate, that's You've got five offices that cover the state. I think everybody here on this call, you're in our area. So I think you're always going to be getting uh, warnings from our office, uh, at least from what I understand. Uh, so why do we go about and train storm spotters? Well, we usually end up doing 35 to 40 of these classes per year. So there must be a reason, and, and there's a good one. Of course, with COVID-19, we haven't done as many as, <laughs> as we normally would. We had to cancel a lot of them. Uh, unfortunately, but uh, you know, the, what you see right here, uh, this is our radar, that big golf ball looking thing that's sitting on a big T. Uh, that's the, that's our weather surveillance radar, uh, what we call the, what we call the WSR 88D. Uh, and basically what that's doing is it's trend, it's sending out a, a microwave pulse of energy. That energy hits a target and some of that energy gets reflected back to the radar. Uh, whatever gets reflected back to the radar, we make an image out of it. And so we can basically make an image out of what's falling out of a thunderstorm. And we, you know, we can look at the shape of that image uh, and the intensity of the power returned. And that tells us a lot about is, you know, where the heavy rain is, what, the, what does the storm look like internally? It's basically taking an x-ray of the thunderstorm. Uh, what radar can't see, though, is the cloud features. So the clouds are not dense enough to return energy back to the radar. So anything that's a pure cloud feature is completely invisible to radar. So that's one limitation because you as a human can obviously see what's happening with the clouds. Uh, radar can't do that. It's not capable. Uh, so again, the, uh, when radar hits a target and sends back some energy, uh, we make an image uh, of that that we call reflectivity. And that tells us uh, basically how intense uh, the storm is, how intense the rain is falling, um, and where it's raining, uh, stuff like that. Uh, the other part of Doppler radar is the Doppler uh, part, the Doppler effect. Uh, and that basically, you know, this works just like a police officer's uh, speed gun. 
uh, in that, uh, you know, if you're driving right towards or away from a police officer, if they click their speed gun, uh, they can use the Doppler effect to determine how fast you're moving toward or away that poli uh, from that police officer. And weather radar does the same thing. Uh, as energy is returned to the radar, it comes back at a different uh, frequency uh, than what it was uh, sent out at. And we can uh, measure that ch change in frequency uh, to know exactly how fast rain or hail is moving toward or away from the radar. Uh, one of the big benefits of this is if we see something moving toward and away from the radar in close proximity, we know that there has to be a circle in there. So there has to be a circulation. And so that's one of the main tools we use to issue tornado warnings. We can see a circulation in the rain up, up high in the clouds before it reaches the ground. And so that's one of our primary tools uh, to, to issue tornado warnings. Um, radar does have some limitations though. Um, the the uh, pesky earth we have here, it's just, uh, it's, you know, it doesn't cooperate in the fact that it curves. So <laughs> as, uh, as you shoot out a straight beam of energy, uh, that energy keeps rising or keeps moving in a relatively straight line while the earth continues to curve away from that beam of energy. So the further you are away from the radar, the higher up the radar is sampling that thunderstorm. So basically if for storms that are far away from the radar, uh, we have no idea. We don't have any radar coverage at all uh, of what's happening in the lower parts of the storm. Um, so that's, that's one, of the big, uh, one of the big problems. And Cherokee Village, I think, in our warning areas is the place that has the worst radar coverage. Uh, the, the lowest that we can see is about 11,500 feet off the ground. So we can't see anything that's happening in the lowest two miles of that thunderstorm. Uh, and so this is where storm spotters, you know, you're on the ground. Uh, you're, if you have, if you're close to the storm, if you have line of sight, you can fill in that, that missing information. You can tell us what's happening below the radar beam to help us issue better warnings and make sure that we get warnings out before somebody gets hurt. Uh, so on the left-hand side image there, uh, you see a product of basically the, radar ener the radar's energy hitting something and then getting returned back to the radar. Uh, and that's what we call reflectivity. So all of these yellows, oranges, and purples, that's uh, just energy that was returned to the radar. Uh, in a general sense, the hotter the color, uh, the more intense uh, the energy that was returned to the radar. Uh, so the red is usually very heavy rain. Uh, the oranges and yellows is moderate rainfall. Uh, and the green, that's usually light rain. Uh, those areas of uh, purple or intense purple and almost bordering on white, uh, that's usually rain mixed with hail. Uh, hail is very reflective uh, to radar. So uh, when you get hail in a thunderstorm, that causes the reflectivity to jump up quite a bit. Uh, at the bottom of the thunderstorm here, you can, you can see the shape of the storm, so we know where it's raining. But at the bottom of the thunderstorm, you can see this very distinct shape. And uh, have, have any of you guys ever seen this shape on radar before? Okay, so this is, uh, this is what we call a hook echo. Now, the reason why we call it that is uh, if you look at the shape, it almost looks like a fish hook. Uh, and so a hook, a, a hook echo tells us that that thunderstorm is rotating. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a tornado, but we know the hook echo is, is there because the whole thunderstorm is rotating in a counterclockwise direction. Uh, and so when we see a hook, uh, we know we've got a supercell, but we don't necessarily know what's happening. Uh, if there's going to be a tornado, uh, since a tornado is part of the updraft part of the storm, it's basically a cloud feature until there's debris in it. It occurs inside the hook, inside this green area, where we essentially have no data. So right now in this picture, there's an active tornado and that tornado is right in here where we can't see anything on radar. Uh, that blue crosshair thing, that's a storm spotter and he's looking southwest. And this is his perspective. Uh, so what he sees, of course, is a massive, <laughs> very wide tornado. Uh, this is an EF3 tornado over a half mile wide that on radar is completely invisible to us. Now, again, we can see the storm is rotating and we can see that the, the rain is rotating aloft, but in terms of the radar actually seeing the tornado, it can't do that. 
Uh, so that's one of the big reasons why we need storm spotters. Now that red box means we've already issued a tornado warning. So uh, the, you know, the office that issued that thought that the rotation was strong enough to where there could be a tornado. But you know, we, can't, we don't know for sure unless the tornado kicks up debris or unless somebody sees it. And that's, that's, those are the only ways we can confirm a tornado. And of course, we don't want to wait to issue a tornado warning uh, until we see debris, because that means it's too late for somebody, right? So that's, that's not the point of the warning system. We want to get a warning out before any, anybody or anything gets destroyed. Uh, so it, this is where storm spotters play a big role in telling us, uh, informing us what's happening at the lower parts of the thunderstorm so that we can issue better warnings. Uh, the other thing that sp uh, storm spotters do is we understand that in order for people to take action, uh, people have to receive a warning, uh, understand what it means to them, and then they have to believe it's true for them before they take action. Um, and one of the biggest things storm spotters uh, can do is you can help people believe that a warning is, is real. Um, most of the warnings we issue uh, for tornadoes, they start off as Doppler radar indicated. Uh, well, for a Doppler radar indicated tornado, uh, guess what most people do? They go outside to see, is there really a tornado? So <laughs> they're not doing what we want them to do. They're not taking cover. They're, they're taking some action, but that action is not to protect themselves. It's to go outside and look at the storm. Well, I want to make sure this is real. Or they call their friends and everybody's outside looking at the storm to try to see what it looks like. Can I see a tornado? Well, that's obviously not the response we want. That's a warning doing, making things worse, right? They'd be better off just sitting in their house and going outside. Uh, but if they hear storm spotter, local storm spotter has observed a tornado, local law enforcement has observed a tornado, firefighters, uh, local emergency management, anybody in the community that they believe that they know and trust if they believe that you've seen a tornado, we can put that in the warning and people are much more likely to take cover if they know somebody in the community has actually seen this thing and it's not just radar. So in, in, when you inform us about what you're seeing at the lower parts of a thunderstorm, uh, you're, you're giving that warning uh, some, some more meaning for, to people, but you know, you're helping convince them that the danger is real and they've got to take action. So storm spotters genuinely help save lives. Sure, the Weather Service issues warnings, but we can't make people believe the warning is real and take action. That, that takes a community-wide effort uh, of cooperation to get folks, uh, convince folks to get into shelter. Uh, things we'll, we'll talk about in this uh, class here are how to uh, safely report on the, some of the dangerous things that thunderstorms can do, and that's going to include hail, uh, damaging winds, uh, tornadoes, so, and then clouds that precede a tornado, of course. And we're out of the season for it, uh, but winter weather too. Uh, radar just tells us that stuff is falling from the sky. It, it doesn't tell us what that stuff is. So during the winter, if we see a bunch of stuff on radar, we don't necessarily know if it's snowing, sleeting, or freezing rain, or, or just normal rain, uh, until somebody on the ground reports it to us. Now we can make an educated guess because radar is not the only tool we have uh, available to us. If it's 19 degrees out, and we see stuff on radar, we know it's probably not rain, right? <laughs> so, we, but we still need that confirmation from people in the area uh, to let us know exactly what type of winter weather is falling. And so who's a Skywarn spotter? Well, effectively, it's anybody that takes this class, and that's going to include all of you. Uh, that's sort of the point uh, of this class, is to be an official National Weather Service storm spotter. Uh, so what I'm going to do is compare the ingredients that we need to get a thunderstorm uh, developing to the ingredients that make an airplane fly. Um, and for a thunderstorm, we'll, we'll go through these one at a time, uh, but the heat and humidity, instability, and lift, uh, that's what you need to have a thunderstorm. And basically for an airplane to take off in a very simplified way, uh, you need fuel and engine and the proper wing shape in order to get that uh, airplane off the ground and, and moving somewhere. And then we'll talk about how wind shear relates to performance uh, at the end. Uh, so the ingredients, if we look, oops, got a little ahead of myself. Uh, if we look at the first ingredient, heat and humidity is basically the fuel for your thunderstorm. Uh, if you don't have heat and humidity, you, you, do, you basically don't have a storm. It's too dry. You're not going to get a thunderstorm to develop. 
Uh, so just like in an airplane, if you don't have any fuel in the airplane, it's not going anywhere. So if you don't have heat and humidity, you're not going to get a thunderstorm because there's no fuel uh, to drive that thunderstorm. Um, instability. Uh, that's the next thing we need. So if we've got the heat and humidity, um, that's not enough to, you know, get a thunderstorm developing. We also need somewhere for that heat and humidity to go. So instability, it, it's kind of a complicated name for a very simple process that, most, that I think everybody understands. And that process is that warm air tends to rise, right? So uh, instability is just a fancy way of saying warm air rises. Uh, well, we're hot and humid all the time in Arkansas, and so we always have warm air rising, but why don't we always get thunderstorms? Well, uh, the reason is, is if we're hot and humid down, down near the ground, but we're also very hot uh, up there in the atmosphere, the heat and humidity basically has nowhere to uh, move up into. So it basically just sits on the ground, stagnates, and makes life generally unpleasant for all <laughs> those of us uh, stuck on the ground. It, it doesn't allow the heat and the humidity to go anywhere. So instability, what we need uh, for an unstable environment is not just the heat and humidity down low, uh, but we also need cold air aloft. So if we put cold air on top of heat and humidity down low, that heat can continue to rise into the cold air aloft, and that basically gives it a, a conduit to escape. So if we allow the heat and humidity to rise into the atmosphere with cold air aloft, uh, this is just like the engine uh, of an airplane. You've got something that you basically the fuel has some place to go. Now it can do something. Um, the last ingredient uh, basically that you need for a thunderstorm is something to kick everything off. So if you have the heat and humidity and you have the cold air aloft somewhere for that heat and humidity to go to uh, or to lift into, the next thing you need is just something to give it a shove, a gentle shove upwards. Uh, and lift in the atmosphere uh, is going to come from usually from fronts. So a cold front or a warm front or dry line or a stationary front, uh, whatever it is, that all provides lift. It takes low level air and brings it up uh, through the atmosphere. And so that's what drives uh, some of the heat and humidity into that cold air aloft. And once that takes place, the storm takes off all by itself. As soon as that heat and humidity hits the cold air, it just continues to rise all by itself, and it gives you a real big thunderstorm as a result. Um, and basically, this is what I'm comparing to the wing shape of an airplane. Uh, in an airplane, if you have a fuel, uh, if you have fuel and you have an engine, sure, you can get going real fast, but you're not going to go up in the air at all unless you have the proper wing shape. So if, if you want to actually fly, you need the fuel, the engine, and the proper wing shape uh, to allow you to take off. And for us to get any thunderstorm, we need heat and humidity, instability, and lift. That's enough to give us any type of thunderstorm on any given day. Now, the next uh, ingredient uh, I'll show here is wind shear. And when you see this video, uh, just take a look at the clouds and, you know, think about are they moving from right to left or left to right? Okay, so what do we think? What direction were the clouds moving? Both directions. <laughs> Both directions, yep. <clears throat> and so that's basically a, a time lapse demonstration of wind shear. So, wind shear is any change in wind speed or direction with height in the atmosphere. And you can have wind shear on any given day. Doesn't mean you're going to get thunderstorms. It actually has nothing to do with the thunderstorm being there. Uh, but if you have wind shear, and, and a thunderstorm at the same time, wind shear is what takes a normal thunderstorm and makes it a severe thunderstorm. So wind shear basically allows the thunderstorm uh, to live longer and to become uh, better organized by removing the cold air, the rain, falling from the warm rising air. So wind shear is basically what separates the rain from the humidity rising up through the thunderstorm. Uh, and so when we get that, our storms get more dangerous. And I, again, I just have a short demonstration for you comparing this to airplanes again. So uh, on this left-hand video, this is like a demonstration of having a thunderstorm with low wind shear. So uh, this is going to be the performance of an airplane, uh, comparing that to the performance of an airplane with, you know, not a lot of uh, power to it. And 
so you still have a working airplane, right? I mean, it, it is an airplane. You've got the fuel, the engine, the wing shape. It takes off. It's an airplane. It's not going to go super fast. It's not going to do a whole lot of acrobatics or anything, but it, it works. It's an airplane. And so when the wind shear is low and we have a thunderstorm, it still works. It's a, it's a thunderstorm. It produces lightning and rain, but it usually doesn't do a whole lot of damage. It's, it's not, uh, not something that's exciting or dangerous. So we compare that to a different performance airplane here in the video on the right that will hopefully play for you. And so that's just another airplane, right? I mean, they both do the same thing, uh, but obviously one uh, has a much higher uh, performance threshold and is much more dangerous than the other. Uh, and so that's basically the role that wind shear uh, plays for thunderstorms in the atmosphere. Uh, when you have wind shear and a thunderstorm, chances are you're going to get a much higher performing, uh, much more dangerous thunderstorm. Uh, and here's a basic outlook of uh, what types of weather and storms we get across the United States based on the energy for storms and wind shear. Uh, and you'll find Arkansas is uh, sitting nicely on the border of nightmare tornado zone and air made of hot soup. So that's, <laughs> that's pretty much where we lie, is uh, right, right near those two uh, uh, areas there. So we, we, get, uh, we get our fair share of uh, variety of, of weather. We don't get hurricanes, luckily, and we don't get too many wildfires. But other than that, we get just about everything else. Uh, so when us, when we as meteorologists, when we're trying to make a forecast for are we going to get dangerous thunderstorms on any given day, uh, of course, we look for the three ingredients to just determine do we have a chance for storms at all. But if we do, then we look at wind shear uh, and the energy available for storms uh, to determine are we going to get a single thunderstorm that basically develops, goes straight up, produces rain, the rain falls right through the hot, humid, rising air, and that makes the storm collapse. Uh, these types of storms, they're called, sometimes called pop-up storms or popcorn thunderstorms, really common in the summer when the jet stream is way up there in Canada. Uh, so when we get those, they, you know, they last 30 to 45 minutes, and they basically rain themselves out. And that causes the storm to collapse. Uh, if we add a little more wind shear uh, to the to the thunderstorm that's already there, uh, the storm gets more organized. So it can basically organize into clusters uh, that produces lots of rain over and over again over the same area. Uh, that's what usually leads to localized flash flooding if you get a cluster of storms. Uh, and then on the uh, third image there, uh, basically this is what happens when thunderstorms organize into a line. And we'll talk about this a little more as we're looking at cloud shapes here. You can kind of see the arced nature of those clouds. That's what we see on radar as a bow echo. It means there is uh, an extreme area of straight line winds uh, that's going to do some damage as that uh, storm system moves through. And then, of course, if we have the most energy and the most wind shear in the atmosphere and we still get thunderstorms, that's when we get the special class of thunderstorms that we call supercells. Uh, the thing that makes a supercell super is the hot, humid air that's rising in it. It's rotating as it's rising. So that rotation within the rising air inside the thunderstorm is what allows that thunderstorm to uh, support large hail, uh, produce stronger uh, winds. And of course, because it's a source of rotation, um, those, those are also the thunderstorms we look at as being possible of producing tornadoes. So after all of that, you guys should be ready to go. You should be experts and just forecast severe storms, right? <laughs> Why not, right? <laughs> okay, maybe not. So that's, that's where we come in. Uh, for, so you can always check us out at uh, www.weather.gov forward slash LZK. That'll take you right to your local Arkansas uh, webpage there. If you just do weather.gov, you'll just get a picture of the whole United States, and then you can click on Arkansas to get to our office. But either way, that's a direct link to our office. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the webpage is not the prettiest thing in the world, but uh, it, it, you know, it's... It's commercial free. It's got the best weather forecast that the biggest weather nerds in the world that can possibly give you. So it's always worth checking out. Our primary focus is public safety. So if dangerous storms are possible on any given day, that's the main thing we're going to be focusing on is where, when, and how bad those storms are going to get.
Uh, you can also follow us on social media at NWS Little Rock uh, on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, when we're actually issuing warnings, that usually only shows up on Twitter. Uh, because if you post too, much, too many things too quick on Facebook, it actually shuts down your account because it thinks you're spamming uh, the internet. So we, can't, we generally can't put warnings on Facebook because Facebook will stop those messages from getting out to the world. Uh, but Twitter doesn't do that, so we can broadcast warnings and short-term updates on Twitter. Um, but again, that, that's, those are our resources to how you can get information from us. If, if you're awake and you have a favorite TV meteorologist, that's great. They all do a really good job covering severe weather. Uh, the problem is, is you have to be awake and paying attention to know that there's dangerous storms approaching. Uh, as long as you're tuned in uh, to, you know, your favorite weather person while severe weather is approaching you, uh, you'll, you'll get a great, uh, great heads up and they'll tell you what's coming and how bad they think it's going to be because we work with all the broadcast meteorologists as well. So I'm not telling you to abandon your local TV folks, but Again, you, you do have to be paying attention and you have to be on the right station to get that information. Uh, so the weather service, uh, when most people hear about us, it's uh, usually because they hear that uh, sort of mechanical tone that the National Weather Service has issued a tornado warning for Faulkner County until 6.15 p.m. Uh, and so that's, that's us, right? We're the only uh, entity that actually issues severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. And the purpose of those warnings is to try to get people in harm's way to do something, uh, to seek protective action. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, to, for people to take action, for people to take cover, uh, they have to go through this three-step process. They have to receive the warning, understand what it means, and then believe that it's true so that they actually take shelter and move their family to shelter. I told you about how you guys can help people believe that the warning is real, uh, but I didn't talk about the, how do you receive warnings and how, do you understand what the warning means? So first off, how do you receive warnings? Well, as I talked about, you can, if, if you're awake and you know severe weather is approaching, you can tune into any of the local TV stations, uh, be it 4, 7, 11, or 16. They all do a great job covering severe weather. All have very competent meteorologists, so it's always a good idea to tune into them. Uh, your, your smartphone, if you have one. Uh, you can get tornado warnings and flash flood warnings on that. Um, the uh, weather radio down there, uh, the thing that little, that white boxy thing that says tornado, uh, that's the only official way that the weather service directly broadcasts warnings to people. Uh, and we're not allowed to sell weather radios, right? We're part of the federal government, so we don't sell things. Uh, but we do broadcast on, the fre on frequencies that, the we that that particular weather radio receives. Uh, and so that broadcast is just, again, 24-7, 365, pure weather information. And if you've ever turned it on and listened to it, my gosh, is it ever boring. I mean, it, it is the most boring thing you've ever heard in your life. It's, it is not for entertainment, uh, unless you have a very different view of entertainment than I do. <laughs> uh, it's, it just cycles through the forecast over and over again. It's not there to listen to. I mean, you can, of course. It's always, it's always playing. It's not really there to listen to. It's there to wake you up, to let you know something dangerous is approaching your location. So we consider uh, weather radios like a smoke alarm for bad weather. Uh, it's not really there to listen to. It's there to wake you up if something dangerous approaches. So that's why we encourage folks to get a weather radio. Uh, we're not trying to sell it, but we know it's going to work as dangerous storms approach. Uh, there are other ways, of course, if uh, outdoor warning sirens uh, and some counties have like reverse 911 systems, like I think uh, Faulkner County, I think I downloaded the app a while ago, I forget what it was called, uh, Code Red or something like that. Um, but, it, you know, different counties have different software that you may be able to download, Everbridge, uh, things of that nature. Uh, that will also give you uh, weather alerts on your cell phone or just on your home phone. It'll give you a call if you want to sign up for that. Uh, the one thing I would not rely on, though, is the outdoor warning sirens. Uh, for, the most, for the most part, they're only designed to be heard outdoors. And even if you can hear them on their normal test day, which for most locations is noon on Wednesday, even if you can hear them on a test day, you may not hear them at all during a thunderstorm. The strong winds, the roar of the winds, uh, maybe the sound of the hail, you know, hitting the ground and hitting your roof, thunder, uh, all of that may drown out the sound of an outdoor warning siren. 
And so don't ever rely on those outdoor warning sirens to be your only method of getting weather information. Uh, it just can't be. It's, they, things go wrong with those all the time, and they're only meant to be heard outdoors. So unless you plan on staying outside until a tornado strikes, <laughs> Don't rely on those to get warnings. Use one of these other methods. And we always recommend having more than one because anything can happen. Something could blow up a weather radio tower and then your weather radio is not working anymore. Something could hit a cell phone tower and now your cell phone's, you know, you're out of service. So if you have a couple of ways to get warnings, that's, uh, that's the best, you know, the best thing you can do to prepare to get advanced knowledge of a dangerous storm approaching. Uh, the next thing is understanding uh, what a warning means. So uh, we issue tornado watches and tornado warnings. So what do you think is worse, a, a watch or a warning? Warning. <laughs> yeah, the, the warning, right? As the, uh, as the picture implies there, uh, the, the, you know, this, uh, the wicked witch watch uh, is somebody that could be, something that could be dangerous, but the warning means uh, she's, she's already there. So uh, the, a warning means that we've detected a dangerous storm near your location or a storm spotter has told us that the storm is already doing bad things near your location. And you've got to take action right now to protect your life and protect your property. Uh, when we talk about a watch, all those ingredients that I spent the, all, you know, all that time telling you about how thunderstorms work, all that means is all those ingredients are in place. You've got the heat and humidity, the instability, and the lift. Uh, once something goes, it's probably going to be bad. But you could be looking at blue skies under a tornado watch. It's possible that nothing at all is happening yet. A warning means a bad storm is approaching. You need to, you need to do something. A watch might mean, hey, clean out your tornado shelter just in case, right? If you've been using it to store, you know, your Christmas tree and ornaments, maybe put move them somewhere so you can get into the tornado shelter when you need to. Uh, and here's basically all of the people that are generally responsible for getting warnings out to the public. Uh, the top left picture, that's a picture from our office. You'll see lots and lots of computers, uh, lots of images of radar, satellite imagery. Th those are all tools we use to issue warnings. And then you see lots of nerds sitting in front of those computers. And that's our office. That's us. Uh, what you don't see a whole lot of are, are these things, the windows. Uh, so we don't actually see the clouds, right? We're, we're not seeing the clouds. We're, we're generally not seeing the weather that's happening right outside. We're looking at data from a, you know, from a computer and issuing warnings based on that information. So uh, on the bottom right, those are storm spotters. Uh, looking at the clouds, if you report back to us, you can fill in that big missing piece of information that we can't just see on our computers. Uh, once we issue a warning, again, all your local TV stations on the top right, they do a great job of broadcasting that information. And then on the bottom left, uh, that's just a picture meant to represent emergency managers uh, and first responders in general. Folks that are taking reports, finding out where to allocate resources, maybe search and rescue, uh, first responders, whatever it is, uh, to get people there to, to help you out or uh, you know, move out of the way as needed. Uh, and we call this whole group of people, you guys included, uh, our, our integrated warning team. That's how a message truly gets to the public. It's not just the weather service issuing a warning and people getting that warning. It's we issue a warning and lots of different people tell you that that uh, storm is headed for you. That's what we want. If you hear the same message over and over again, uh, social science has taught us that people are more likely to take it seriously and to take action uh, rather than just getting a warning from a single source. Uh, of course, it's always good to have a way to get weather information. There's lots of good places you can go to get basic weather information on the forecast. Uh, I mean, you know, of course, our forecasts are are pretty good. We, we study the science of it constantly. We're always trying to update our understanding of the atmosphere, but wherever you get your weather forecast, just make sure you have a way to get updates. Uh, because, you know, typically in the United States, we have uh, four pretty distinct seasons. And in Arkansas, we can see all four of those seasons in a single day. So <laughs> uh, just have a way to get weather updates uh, so you know what's happening, what's headed your way at any given time. Uh, this video here, and I hope it plays through, uh, this is basically uh, somebody that's uh, driving, and this is near Mountainburg, Arkansas, so northwest Arkansas. Uh, they're driving, and they're not aware of something that's uh, 
going to cross the road up ahead of them. And I'll just let the video play and hopefully it plays smoothly for you. Look at that car, they're flying. So I, I don't know, did, were you guys able to see the video? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's good. I'm glad that's, that's working better than our join me conference uh, then. Uh, so the, the guy in the foreground here, he was the one driving that vehicle. He had just bought a brand new camper or trailer or something and his car and that trailer got rolled and you can see that the trailer was completely trashed. Um, Luckily, the tornado didn't loft them, so it didn't lift the car up. It just rolled them off the uh, off the highway. So, they they actually survived this with just very minor injuries. But again, that's pure luck. Uh, obviously, they didn't know what was happening. They didn't have a warning. They weren't aware of the signs that something dangerous was approaching, and they drove right into it. And so, you know, during this course, hopefully, I'll give you the tools to avoid ending up like this. Um, I don't want you to survive a dangerous storm because you got lucky. I want you to survive a dangerous storm because you knew what to do. Uh, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a lot better, a lot more reliable. Uh, so when we issue a severe thunderstorm warning, what we consider a severe thunderstorm is a storm that can produce one inch or greater diameter hail or 60 mile per hour or greater winds. Uh, those are basically the thresholds at which one inch or larger hail, it hurts, so it can, it can hurt you. Uh, or the 60 mile per hour winds, it can start to blow down trees, power lines, your fence, things like that. Uh, things that generally can be dangerous. Uh, so those, those thresholds are, they're somewhat subjective. Uh, you know, again, just based on what storms typically do damage wise, uh, but that they're good rules of thumb. And it, you know, if we issued warnings for every thunderstorm, nobody would pay attention to it. And of course, every thunderstorm is dangerous because what does every thunderstorm produce? Lightning. Yeah, lightning, right? So any lightning strike can kill you. But we, if we issued a severe thunderstorm for every thunderstorm, people would just ignore the warning. So we, we have to have some threshold of the thunderstorm being able to do something else besides produce lightning uh, that you know warrants taking action. So one inch hail, 60 mile per hour winds, those are basically the thresholds at which people get hurt or your property gets hurt uh, outside of lightning, of course. Uh, the uh, large hail comes from strong updrafts in the thunderstorm. The strong winds come from strong downdrafts uh, in a thunderstorm. Of course, any rotation in the, in the thunderstorm could lead to a tornado. So, so we are always on the uh, outlook for that as well, uh, look out for that as well. So as we talk about cloud features here, uh, I'm going to focus on two types of clouds. And if you don't learn anything else from this class, uh, if you just walk away with the knowledge of being able to look at a thunderstorm and know if you're looking at the updraft part of the storm versus the downdraft part of the storm, you're, you're well on your way to being a great storm spotter, probably better off than mo most storm spotters out there. And, and that's what it all starts off with, is if you look at a storm, can I determine where its updraft is compared to where its downdraft is? Uh, again, that's, we'll talk about more than that, but that's the basic concept. You've got to understand that before you can move on to more advanced things. So understand the difference between updraft and downdraft clouds just by looking at them, uh, not by name. If you can do that, then other things you'll, you'll be able to identify, you'll be able to look at a storm and know if it's a supercell, basically know if the storm is rotating, and you'll be able to understand uh, and be able to, be able to identify the clouds that serve as precursors to tornadoes. But you can't do that without the basic understanding of updraft versus downdraft. And in general, we're trying to avoid reports of Winnie the Pooh shaped clouds, right? <laughs> I mean... It's interesting, but it's probably not going to hurt anybody. So we don't necessarily need that observation. Uh, so the updraft part of a thunderstorm. Uh, this is, as the name implies, this is where all the air is moving from the ground up, uh, into, the, up into the thunderstorm. Uh, so it's like a vacuum cleaner for all the heat and humidity. 
I remember I told you the heat and humidity is the fuel for the thunderstorm. So the updraft is basically sucking up all the fuel, all the heat and humidity from all around it, and it's driving it up into that thunderstorm. So the, the thunderstorm basically is acting like an engine for heat and humidity, moving it off the ground to the top of the atmosphere. And, and in doing so, what it's doing is it's, as that air rises, it's cooling, and it's also you, the humidity starts to fall out as rainfall. So it condenses and it starts to fall out of the storm as rain. So it's basically taking all that heat and humidity and converting it into cooler air and rainfall uh, that takes the heat away from the ground and uh, cools it off. So that's why thunderstorms are there is to rebalance the atmosphere, get rid of the excess of heat and humidity, turn it into cooler, more stable air. Uh, the important reason why you'd want to visually identify the updraft uh, is if there's going to be a tornado, it's going to occur under the updraft cloud. So that's why it's so important to look at a storm and know whether you're looking at updraft or downdraft. You can see some really scary looking clouds in the downdraft, but there's no tornado threat. If you find the updraft and then you see scary looking clouds, then we might be looking at something, right? Then, then a tornado might be more likely. Uh, the thing to look for in, in an updraft, one of the main clues is it's not raining in the updraft. And you've probably been underneath an updraft several times in your life and you didn't realize it because if you're under the updraft and there's no tornado, nothing happens. Nothing happens at all. The air's just rising up over your head. You don't feel it. Uh, if you look up, you just see a flat cloud. You know, no, no big deal. Uh, the downdraft part of the thunderstorm is the part you usually notice and most people think of when they think of, oh, I've been through a thunderstorm. Uh, most people think of a thunderstorm as the part of the thunderstorm they can feel. Be it the strong winds, the heavy rain, the hail, this is all stuff that's moving from the top of the thunderstorm down to the ground. So most of what you've experienced as a thunderstorm in your entire life is the downdraft part of uh, the thunderstorm. Again, this is where all the rain, uh, hail, and, and strong winds associated with that rain coming down uh, out of the top of the clouds, uh, this is where all of that falls. Nice thing about it is because that air is sinking, you can't get a tornado in, inside the updraft region. The other good thing is the updraft makes up most of the thunderstorm. So 80 to 90% of your thunderstorm is not a tornado threat, but that 10 to 20% that's updraft is. So it's really important to find that small part of the thunderstorm that could produce a tornado. Mo the other part of the thunderstorm could do damage. It's just not going to be tornado damage. And I don't want to undersell the strength of a downdraft. Uh, it's, it's not a tornado, but you could still get real, heavy, real large hail and very strong winds uh, from the downdraft region. Uh, this is a cartoon view of where the updraft and the downdraft are typically located. Uh, the updraft typically occurs on the backside of the thunderstorm. So basically all of your heat and humidity rises. And as it rises, the strong winds aloft carry uh, the rain that starts condensing out of that rising hot humid air, uh, the, the strong winds aloft carry the rain away from the hot humid rising air, uh, and it starts to fall out, out ahead of the thunderstorm is what we call downdraft. Uh, we, out ahead of it, we get a gust front, a shelf cloud. Behind it, we get real heavy rain, and then you get some hail. And as you approach the updraft region, this is where you could see a wall cloud and potentially a tornado. So as the storm is moving towards you, you generally get the downdraft first, and then the updraft is, you know, the last part, the back part of the thunderstorm. Now, this is just a cartoon view of what it looks like, but that cartoon is, is pretty representative of what this actually looks like. Uh, this is uh, basically, you know, somebody in an, uh, in an aircraft taking a picture of a thunderstorm. And you can clearly see the, the difference here. Here's your updraft. Uh, you can see some flat, smooth clouds here uh, leading to a, a big cylinder that leads up and into the thunderstorm. This is where all your hot, humid air is rising. And if you look below that flat, smooth cloud, nothing's happening. There's no rain, nothing, nothing exciting going on. It just looks like a flat, smooth cloud. You look over here and you see all this real heavy stuff or all this, these very dark clouds that almost look like they're on the ground. That's the heavy rain falling out of the thunderstorm. So the updraft is on the backside of the thunderstorm. The downdraft is on the leading edge. And so we know the storm is basically moving from its updraft towards its downdraft. So we get a, 
a general idea of what, which way the storm is moving if you can identify those parts of the storm. This is what updraft clouds look like. Uh, they're basically big towers of cumulus clouds. And cumulus clouds are just those big puffy white clouds that look like a stalk of cauliflower. Uh, so the, a big tower of those very sharp looking cumulus clouds is how we identify an updraft. So if you're looking to find the updraft of a thunderstorm, basically from right above those flat smooth clouds down low, you wanna look for a big tower of cumulus clouds all the way up to the top of the storm. If you find that, that's the part of the thunderstorm where the warm, humid, uh, the hot, humid air is rising. Um, some basic clues to, to find an updraft. Uh, again, down low, we're looking at very flat, smooth, and if I could describe it, it'd be very boring looking clouds. Uh, the bottom part of an updraft doesn't look scary or dangerous at all until it gets a wall cloud. Uh, the bottom part of the updraft looks like a very flat, smooth, uh, harmless cloud. It, it doesn't look like there's any danger at all. It's just flat, smooth, very boring looking. Uh, however, if you look above it, you should see a big tower of cumulus clouds leading to the top of the thunderstorm. Uh, this is what tells you this is where all the hot, humid air is rising, and then it's rising up into the thunderstorm. And the reason why it's tilted like that is the strong winds aloft are basically tilting the thunderstorm sideways. And so that's what keeps the hot, humid air rising uh, and the cold air, it prevents the cold air from falling into the hot, humid rising air. So that's what allows these thunder thunderstorms like this to uh, stick around for a longer period of time, makes them more likely to pick up more rain and hail and, and more likely to be severe. Uh, so when we see the rain removed from the updraft like that, usually you're looking at a storm that's capable of doing some sort of damage. Uh, and again, you look below that flat, smooth cloud, we don't see any rain. Although over here, you can see some of those light rain streaks falling from the clouds. Uh, if you get really close to the updraft, um, you can't see the cumulus clouds because they're basically over your head. Uh, so this is if you're within about a half mile of the updraft, um, all you can see is the low level clouds. <clears throat> And so the, the low-level clouds, again, the only weird thing about the low levels of an updraft cloud is how unnaturally flat and smooth that they look. It almost looks like a piece of drywall on the bottom part of the storm. Uh, it's just very sharp, uh, very flat and smooth. If you see that, that that's where you would want to look, look up and see if you see those cumulus clouds. I certainly don't want you to go away from this class afraid of every flat, smooth cloud that you see because they're not all dangerous. They're only dangerous when they're attached to a thunderstorm. So make sure it's attached to a thunderstorm before you go running for your shelter, right? <laughs> no need to do that if you just see a flat, smooth cloud out there. Uh, but this does give you a good view of the updraft uh, where it's very flat and smooth. We can obviously see it's not raining. Uh, and then the downdraft. You can see where all these gray streaks are. This is basically rain uh, falling from the clouds. So you can see Dennis, that very stark difference there. Dennis, this is Sam. Um, yeah. Does the rain kill the updraft cloud? Uh, As the rain falls and the, and the updraft is trailing behind the rain, does it kill that storm? Yeah, if the, if the basically if the, um, if the winds aloft aren't strong enough to push the rain away from the updraft, the rain will fall right into the hot, humid, rising air, and that cold, sinking air will kill the storm. Okay. So it'll, it'll knock all the hot, humid air out of the way, and that will cause the, the thunderstorm to collapse very quickly. Okay. And so that, uh, that happens when we don't have much wind shear. So if the winds at the top of the thunderstorm are not faster or moving out of a different direction than the winds down low, you're right, the rain falls right back into the updraft and the thunderstorm tends to collapse pretty quickly. Okay. Is there an optimum speed for those winds aloft? I mean, it seems like there might be uh, too fast or too slow. Yeah, the, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's always a balance between how much energy you have for storms versus how, how fast the wind shear is. Uh, there are cases where you know, I've seen the, the wind shear be too strong because there wasn't enough energy for thunderstorms. And so essentially the thunderstorm, as it just developed, it got sheared apart. It basically just fell over uh, and never was able to get going. Uh, however, if you have enough energy for thunderstorms, there's so much energy, buoyant energy, uh, pushing the air upwards 
that regardless of how strong the winds are aloft, that thunderstorm remains intact. And usually that's, if that happens, that's usually when you end up with those uh, rare instances of big tornado outbreaks. So we don't often get a ton of energy for storms and very strong wind shear at the exact same time. Uh, but when we do, uh, that results in those tornado outbreaks that usually get names, um, like the Super Tuesday tornado outbreak. People will call it something because it, it was so, it, it hit and affected so many people and produced so many tornadoes that it was memorable. Um, so those conditions don't always line up well, but um, you know, when, when you get enough energy and uh, wind shear, very strong wind shear, it, it can happen. Uh, most of the time when you have a, you know, an average amount of thunderstorm energy, uh, and then your average wind shear, you'd be looking at a change in wind speed of about 40 knots from the bottom of the storm to the top. And so that would ideally be what would give you a, just a, you know, a normal severe thunderstorm. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, now, if you're a long ways away from the thunderstorm, uh, I, I showed you a picture of when you're very close to the updraft, what it looks like. If you're a long way, like 10 miles plus away from the thunderstorm, you can't see the low-level clouds at all. They basically blend in, into the horizon. But you can still see the big tower of cumulus clouds leading from the lower part of the storm all the way to the top. And so you know where the updraft is, and if you want to see what's happening in the lower part of the updraft, uh, this gives you a visual target on where you would want to drive to. Now, I, I will caution you, if you're going to drive towards an updraft, you better know what you're doing because you could accidentally drive into the most dangerous part of the storm, you know, if, if you don't have escape options. So uh, right now, the storm is moving away from you. It's in no danger of hitting you at all. But if you wanted to see if there was something there, this does, this does give you a visual target to drive in that general direction to see it, to see what's happening down low. Uh, now, if you're, you know, a, a moderate distance from the storm, three to five miles away, you can see the low-level clouds, and you can also see the tower of cumulus leading up into the storm, uh, but you can't see the top of the storm. So there's always, there's always a give and take. The further you are away, you can see the, the whole depth of the storm. The closer you are, you get more details on the low-level parts of the storm. Um, I would recommend for the most part, ideally, if you could position yourself to stay in this three to five mile away corridor to where you're not going to get directly hit by the storm, but you can see what's happening. And I know in Arkansas, this is a problem because we have lots of trees and we don't have many flat plains like, like you see in this picture. Uh, but of course, I, I have to show you these pictures of ideal situations because if I showed you a picture of trees covering clouds, I wouldn't be able to show you anything. All, all you'd be looking at is treetops. So <laughs> that's not very instructional. So that's, that's why a lot of these pictures come from the plains. Uh, but I, again, you look at this flat, smooth clouds down low, big tower of cumulus clouds above it. Uh, that's how you know you're looking at updraft. Uh, and this is basically an animation of uh, an updraft in a supercell. And inside the updraft, uh, this, this supercell has given us a warning sign that it might produce a tornado. Uh, so this supercell, uh, this updraft, uh, you can see a wall cloud developing within the updraft. So you've got the, the flat, smooth clouds down low here, uh, and then you can see this low-hanging, sort of scary, blocky-looking cloud developing out of the updraft. Uh, when you see that, uh, that's, that's dangerous. That's the thunderstorm giving you a, a warning, saying, hey, look out, I might produce a tornado. So that's visually what the uh, thunderstorm will show you uh, before a tornado develops. So this gives you a few minutes of a heads up, uh, generally speaking, before a tornado is there. Uh, the reason why you have a wall cloud is if you look carefully at what's happening here, you can see over here on the far right-hand side, it's rain. Uh, if you follow that rain close to the ground, you'll notice that that gr dark gray appearance, there's a thin line of it that goes all the way across the ground and then back into the updraft. So what happens when you get a wall cloud, the updraft is so strong, it's preventing rain from hitting the ground. So the, basically the rain, instead of hitting the ground, it gets sucked sideways and then back up into the thunderstorm. Uh, so if, you know, if the uh, updraft is strong enough to suck rain back up into the clouds, uh, you know you've got a very dangerous storm on your hands. And again, this, this gives us a warning sign uh, that the storm could become a tornado threat. 
But basically, the wall cloud is there because it's sucking up rain that did not get a chance to hit the ground. And so that's, that's why you see that. But it's important that you find the updraft because this scary looking cloud uh, can be in lots of places that are actually the downdraft part of the storm. But we can look here, we know we see the flat smooth clouds down low, a tower of clouds leading above it. We know this is updraft. It's not raining anywhere around here, but this storm is sucking up the rain that didn't get a chance to hit the ground and that's why you've got a wall cloud. Uh, now, something else you can pay attention to, if you're a storm spotter, if you're out there near the updraft, uh, this is something you can, only you as a storm spotter will, will ever be able to feel this. And you can see what's uh, happening to the wheat here in this field. So here's, here's the wall cloud, and there's actually a tornado here. Uh, so this is the core of your updraft. Uh, between the tornado and the person taking this picture, are these low-hanging ragged clouds that we call the rear flank downdraft, but we'll get to that in a minute. The updraft is out here in the middle, and basically the updraft is so strong, it's sucking up all the air and all the winds from all around it. And you can actually see the wheat bending down in and towards uh, the tornado, uh, because that's how far that wind field extends uh, from the updraft. So the updraft is sucking up all the heat and humidity and a good five mile radius around that storm. So if you were taking this picture and you were looking at updraft, you would, able to, you would be able to feel the winds at your back moving towards the cloud you're looking at. And again, so you'd be able to feel that and you'd be able to see that. You'd be able to feel the winds surging at your back towards the updraft. And that's an environmental clue that can, uh, that can help, you know, raise your confidence that you're looking at updraft clouds and not downdraft clouds. Uh, and this is basically the, the last example of an updraft cloud that I have for you. And it's because it's, uh, well, it's, it's a great photographer that left the shutter open for like a minute to capture this beautiful image here. Um, but you can, you can actually see there's a, if you look at the bottom of the storm there, there's a, what looks, what appears to be a small tornado. Uh, so this is the updraft. Right above that tornado, we have flat, smooth clouds, the bottom part of the updraft. And if you look above that, that leads up into a big tower of cumulus clouds all the way to the top of the thunderstorm. So that's basically the vertical stacking of your updraft. The tornado is the lowest part of your updraft, up to the wall cloud, up to the flat, smooth clouds down low, and then a big tower of cumulus clouds above that. And so that's how an updraft should present itself. And again, that's just a small part of the storm. You look how massive that storm is and look how small the tornado is by comparison. So the updraft part of a storm is the smallest part of the storm. But of course, if you're near it, this is, you know, you don't want to be hit by the tornado. Most people won't be hit by the tornado when the storm moves over them. But if you're in that path, you need to know it and you need, you need to take cover so you don't get hurt. Uh, do we have any questions about updraft clouds before I dive into downdraft here? What causes the tornado to descend if it's, or is it actually descending if there's an updraft right there? Uh, so, yeah, that's a good question. And what causes the, the tornado to descend is, as we understand it, the, um, there's basically two parts of a downdraft, which we haven't gotten to yet, but there's the main downdraft where most of the rainfall is, is occurring. Uh, and then the hook echo part of the rain, the, the hook echo part of the storm is what we call the rear flank downdraft. And so in, in the middle, uh, you have the updraft. So basically the updraft is getting squeezed between two areas of downdraft. Uh, and if that updraft is rotating, if you take something that's rotating and you squeeze it, it causes that rotation to speed up. And so if you get just the right amount of squeezing, you, if it squeezes too fast, it kills the thunderstorm with cold air. But if you get just the right amount of squeezing, it causes that circulation to, you know, build up and go faster and faster until it extends. It stretches uh, basically that circulation from the storm base down to the ground. And that's, as far as we know, that's how uh, tornadoes develop in a thunderstorm. Uh, it's got to be squeezed between two areas of downdraft uh, for you to get that tornado. Were those, were those clouds, clouds flattened out in that updraft? What causes them to flatten out and at what height are they generally? 
Uh, so the, the height, the height is going to vary. Um, usually if you're going to get tornadoes, the height of those clouds is only going to be about 2000 feet off the ground. Um, in, in my example here where I took this picture, this was in Eastern Montana and there, in this case, there was, these clouds were not showing any threat of producing a tornado at all. And I wasn't looking for tornadoes. I was actually looking for hail uh, with this thunderstorm, believe it or not. But uh, this is probably more like four or 5,000 feet off the ground. So the, the height of the, the flat cloud base off the ground uh, is tied to the relative humidity down at the surface. So the higher the relative humidity down on the ground, uh, the lower that cloud base will be. Um, if you want to know the technical term, it's called the lifted condensation level. Basically, if you lift air up, where does it start to produce rain droplets? And, uh, you know, when here in Arkansas, we're, we're, we are typically very hot and humid when storms develop. Uh, your updraft base is usually going to be in that 2,000 to 2,500 foot range off the ground. Uh, and the reason it's so flat and smooth is because uh, as the air rises, uh, you know, as the air is uh, from all around the storm, as it rises up into the storm, it's doing so pretty uniformly. So there's not much turbulence there. So without turbulence, that allows those clouds to be very flat and smooth. They're basically, the air is condensing at the same level uh, because all of the air being sucked up into the thunderstorm has the same relative humidity. So that creates a very flat, smooth cloud base. Uh, once you have downdraft, uh, that everything changes because you're messing with, you're messing with the, the whole environment around the thunderstorm. Uh, the downdraft uh, is going to have, whoops, uh, very low hanging, scary looking clouds because all the rain and strong winds from the top of the storm, as it hits the ground, it doesn't just hit the ground and stop. It hits the ground and bounces and then spreads out at the same time. So you get an extreme amount of turbulence in the downdraft. Uh, and the relative humidity varies quite a bit because nothing's rising. So you see lots of different cloud levels based on the relative humidity on where the rain is and where the rain, where the rain's the heaviest and where the rain is a little bit lighter. You see different heights of the cloud there. Uh, and so that, that generally makes your downdraft clouds uh, look very low hanging, ragged, and, and generally scary looking compared to updraft clouds. Is, did that help or make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. great. Yeah, okay, sure. Cool. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll move on to downdraft clouds here. And as I already described, basically what's happening with the downdraft is this is the leading edge of your storm. Uh, this is where all the, the rain and wind that is falling from the top of the storm, this is where it hits the ground. And again, as it hits the ground, uh, it does two things. For one, it bounces. So it produces a lot of turbulence, which is why you see these low hanging, scraggly looking clouds there. And it also starts to spread out along the ground. And so it's, uh, you know, if the updraft is like a giant vacuum cleaner for all the heat and humidity, the downdraft is like a giant leaf blower. It's blowing out or venting out all the stuff that the thunderstorm sucked up. Uh, so the, again, this is where all your uh, rain, strong winds and hail are falling. Uh, and if you're, you know, you see these really scary low hanging clouds this looks very ominous, right? So basically, if it looks like the alien mothership has landed and it's invading your neighborhood, that's probably the downdraft clouds that are headed your way. Um, behind the downdraft clouds, it also looks very dark and ominous, especially during the day, because you can see the sun's still out, but then it's raining so heavily that it blocks out all the sun. Uh, so then it's just very dark behind these clouds. Uh, sometimes, uh, and Oftentimes, when you have an organized storm approaching you, uh, these downdraft clouds, they'll line up uh, into one big line or one big bow shape uh, at the leading edge of the thunderstorm. Uh, and so you can see the leading edge here. We have these low-hanging ragged clouds, and you can see sort of behind it some of these weird just low-hanging floating clouds uh, around it. Uh, again, this is all downdraft, uh, low-hanging ragged looking clouds, very dark uh, behind it. Uh, throughout the years, uh, storm spotters have described the straight line of low-hanging ragged clouds uh, as a shelf. And so it, it's picked up the name a shelf cloud. So a shelf cloud is generally the leading edge of where your downdraft is. 
uh, the shelf cloud tells you that the storm is moving directly at you. So the person taking this picture, if they don't move, the storm is going to move directly over them. So they're, they're going to get some really strong winds, really heavy rain. The temperature is going to drop pretty dramatically. Uh, and then you could get some hail mixed in as well. So if you're staring at a shelf cloud, that means the storm's moving towards you. If you'd rather not get wet, that's a good time to go inside. So, <laughs> uh, but that, that means the, the, again, the storm, this is the front leading edge of the storm. Uh, this is basically what's pushing towards you. The updraft would be all the way behind this on the other side of the thunderstorm. And so what we're looking for, uh, you know, downdraft clues, uh, we're looking for ragged, uh, choppy clouds uh, along their base. A lot of times they're, they can be organized in a line out in front of the thunderstorm. Uh, and the uh, shelf cloud in general is about 10 times bigger than the wall cloud. Uh, what makes it tricky is they're, the wall cloud and the shelf cloud are both composed of low-hanging, ragged-looking clouds. Uh, the difference between them, though, is that the the downdraft, there's no sign of updraft anywhere around these downdraft clouds. There's no flat, smooth clouds down low that lead up into this. Uh, you just see the low-hanging, ragged-looking clouds, and then it's very dark behind it, showing you all the rain uh, that's falling behind these clouds. Uh, so again, you see a bunch of ragged, choppy-looking clouds. They could be low-hanging and very scary, uh, but if you see all that rain behind it, that can raise your confidence that you're looking at a downdraft and even though it looks like it looks really, really bad, uh, chances are that there's, well, there's no tornado right there for sure, uh, but chances are it's just the strong wind and heavy rain uh, moving your way. Uh, this is not the part of the storm where you would get a tornado. Uh, now, is there a tornado on the backside of that storm? Uh, who knows, right? There, I mean, there could be, and it could eventually move your way, but at this part of the thunderstorm, uh, there's no direct tornado threat. It just means the storm and the heavy rain is moving in your direction. Uh, the other thing you can look for is, again, if you're in the environment, I told you if, you know, if you're looking at an updraft and you're taking a picture of the updraft, you can feel the winds at your back uh, towards those clouds. Well, this is a picture of a you know, disorganized downdraft. You can see the rain off in the distance but you can also see the winds. You can see the winds pushing the wheat field backwards towards the uh, camera, uh, towards the photographer. And you can also see the effect on the lady's dress, right? All the winds are moving from the thunderstorm at, you know, basically blowing in the face of the observer. So if the winds are hitting you in the face as you're looking at those clouds, the chances are as you're looking at downdraft and not updraft clouds. So downdraft is pushing down and away from the thunderstorm updraft, everything is moving uh, in and towards the center of the thunderstorm. And again, this is something we'll never be able to see on radar. It's something only you can feel as a storm spotter out there, you know, storm spotting. We, we can't reproduce this on radar or satellite or anything. This is something uh, solely for storm spotters. You're, you'll be the only ones that can experience this. And this is going to be a video here that shows you what happens if you let that shelf cloud pass over you, right? So all the pictures so far, you've seen the rain is off in the distance. Well, this is what it looks like once you get inside the rain. Oh my God. And so you could uh, hopefully hear the roaring of the wind there. And if you looked in the background, you could see some of those trees just getting snapped and laying down uh, due to those strong winds. Uh, the American flag was hanging on, so that was good. Uh, but most, of the, most everything else was falling and getting broken by those strong winds. Uh, you heard the guy tell his family to get downstairs. That was good advice. He probably should have followed it himself. Because once uh, he realized that, hey, this isn't good, I'm going to go run downstairs myself, the power was out, he couldn't see anything, 
And as he went running for the basement, he tripped over his couch and dropped the camera. And that's what ends the video. So <laughs> he, he doesn't get hurt by the storm, but he, he does at least, you know, embarrass himself and maybe get some minor injury by running into and flipping over his couch as he's running for shelter in the dark. Um, again, this is just to show you some of the power of the winds inside the downdraft. Just because it's not a tornado doesn't mean it can't do damage and doesn't mean it's not a hazard to you. Uh, and again, this is just sort of a humorous video. It is showing you downdraft, but it's just showing you some of the power of the winds associated with what we would call straight line winds or downdraft winds. And so you could see what the winds did. Uh, they, they weren't doing much to most of the cars. You, you could see this little tiny tree maybe got blown over, or maybe it got hit by the car. I don't know. You saw that very light vehicle get carried away and flipped over several times by the strong winds. So <clears throat> you don't need a tornado to do substantial damage. Uh, of course, heavier vehicles aren't going to go flying around in the wind like that. But uh, that's, again, just showing you the, the power of what... Uh, thunderstorm winds can do. And the reason why the audio cuts out, if you're wondering that Mountainburg, uh, you know, video, and then this video, the, the audio cut out, that's on purpose because they're just saying a lot, a lot of bad words. So I just, <laughs> I just cut out the audio so you don't have to listen to all the swearing. The video is still good, but anytime the audio cuts out, it's just, I blocked somebody from swearing. That's it. <laughs> that's the only reason the audio is gone there. Um, so when we're putting it all together, you know, unfortunately, uh, Mother Nature is not going to uh, present itself with labeled clouds and to tell you, hey, this is updraft, this is downdraft, and uh, you, you're going to have to look at it all and make sense of it uh, yourself. Uh, and so this is basically a view, um, assuming that you're oriented uh, to the right of where a supercell thunderstorm is moving. Uh, so if you're, or if you're sitting to the right of the supercell's motion, you look back at the center of the updraft here. This is, this is what you're looking at. Uh, you can see these flat, smooth clouds. The, the picture is kind of misleading. The flat, smooth clouds are more or less coming from over your head and going straight into the middle uh, of the screen there, of the updraft there. But flat, smooth clouds uh, leading right up to this blocky-looking cloud. <clears throat> so this is your wall cloud. And if you look up, it's a little washed out, but right above our wall cloud, you can see some of those cumulus clouds extending up and into, up and into the thunderstorm there. Uh, on the right-hand side, behind the updraft clouds, you can see it's very dark. We've got heavy rainfall. On the left-hand side of the updraft, uh, you can see these clouds here, uh, they're, not, they're not flat and smooth anymore. Uh, they're, it's not super low hanging or, or scary looking, but you can see some of the turbulence and some of the waviness and low hanging clouds associated with this part of the thunderstorm. And this is what we call the rear flank downdraft. Uh, this is basically what we see on radar as the hook echo. And you can actually see the hook in the clouds there. And the weird thing is uh, on radar, all we see is everything inside, uh, you know, inside that hook. It's all filled in. Uh, we see all of this stuff, even though it doesn't look like there's much there. What we don't see behind the hook echo is this. The wall cloud is completely invisible to us on radar. There's nothing there. The wall cloud is just sucking up heat and humidity. The clouds are not dense enough to return any energy to the radar. So the, the wall cloud, and if it were to develop a tornado, we wouldn't be able to see it on radar. We can see the heavy rain here, we can see the rain behind the updraft, and we can see the rain inside the hook echo, but we can't see uh, behind that hook echo, we can't see that wall cloud. And so again, if you, if you understand what you're looking at, this is the part of the storm you would wanna watch very carefully uh, to, see if it's, to see if the wall cloud is rotating, or this is where funnel clouds or a tornado could develop as well. And as far as we know, a tornado could develop at any part of the wall cloud. Could be the front, could be the back. Uh, there's, we don't know the rhyme or reason behind where a tornado develops. We just know it's going to be somewhere in this wall cloud. 
But if you've gotten to this point of looking at a thunderstorm, you've zeroed in on the smallest part of the storm that is a tornado threat. And your wall cloud here is going to be a, about three miles in diameter. So compared to the storm that's at least 10 times bigger, you, you've really zeroed in on the, you know, the part that could produce a tornado. Uh, and so in, in this case, you're basically oriented to the right of where the storm is moving once again. And we basically have the, the same presentation here. Uh, the only difference, you can see your flat, smooth clouds and then leading into your wall cloud right there. And in this case, the wall cloud, within the wall cloud, there's a tornado. So uh, you can actually see what appears to be a relatively small tornado. Uh, I'll tell you, this is not a small tornado. It just looks small because the guy is about four or five miles away, but it looks small. It's actually quite a large tornado. Um, but basically, you can see the tornado. You can clearly see the wall cloud. The flat, smooth clouds, you look up. You can see some of the cumulus clouds that are washed out there in the top of the picture. You know you're looking at updraft right here. So there's two areas of downdraft. There's going to be the main downdraft and then the rear flank downdraft. And for you as a storm spotter, it's really important that you pick out which one is the main downdraft compared to the rear flank downdraft or the hook echo. Uh, because if you find the updraft and you find the main downdraft, the storm is always going to move from the updraft towards the main downdraft. So the, my big question to you is, is how do you visually determine what the main downdraft is versus the rear flank downdraft? Well, it's probably moving some. Yeah, well, yeah you, might be able, you might be able to see some of the storm moving. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say volume of rain. Yes. Yeah. The volume of rain for sure. That's, that's the big difference. Uh, how can you tell where there's a bigger volume of rain falling? Color darkness. Exactly. Darkness. You, you said it perfectly. <clears throat> so the way to find the main downdraft is you look below the cloud level, wherever it's the darkest, that's the main downdraft. So that's where the highest volume of rain is falling. Uh, it's very, very dark. Uh, you know that that's the main downdraft. You, you can see the updraft. It's very evident in this case because there's already a tornado. So we know that this storm is going to move from where it is right now towards the right. So in this case, this storm spotter, if, as long as he doesn't move, he's not going to get hit by this tornado. But even if you saw this tornado and you were afraid of it, you thought it was too close, which way would you drive to get away from it? That way. To the left. <laughs> to the left, exactly. So if you know which way the storm is moving and you don't want any part of it, you drive the opposite direction. And then I don't care if this storm is moving north, south, east, west. It doesn't matter what direction it is moving. All that matters is that you understand what direction the storm is moving relative to your position. If you see this and you know the storm is moving to the right and you want to get out of harm's way, you drive left. And I don't care what cardinal direction that is. You just know which way to drive to get away from that thunderstorm. That's the best way to keep yourself safe as a storm spotter is to look at the thunderstorm, understand its parts, its updraft and its downdraft areas, know which way it's going so that you can get out of harm's way. Uh, you know, if you want to report the tornado, that'd be awesome too. <laughs> but once you do that, uh, get out of harm's way. Make sure you're not part of... Uh, the damaging part of that thunderstorm. Can you go back to that last picture, please? Yeah. Um, the right behind the tornado, there's an area of rainfall. It looks like. Right. Yeah. yeah right here. Yeah. What is that? Is that rain? Is that? It. Uh, it is rain, but it's not rain falling. It's. Uh, it's rain that's getting sucked up by the wall cloud. Okay. So all of the rain, you you'll notice this. Um, sort of the orangish color uh, on the right-hand side of the wall cloud. Mm -hmm. Then if you look down towards the ground, you see a thin band where it's a darker gray. Okay. So this is where all the heavy rain, the updraft is so strong that the heavy rain close to the updraft gets sucked sideways and then back up into the thunderstorm. Okay. So again, you can actually see this suction of the rain going sideways and back up into the thunderstorm. And if you were watching it, you would actually see that, that rain rising up. It's very strange. You shouldn't be watching rain going up into the sky, right? But 
it right. can in the middle of an updraft. <laughs> uh, if you, of course, if you're feeling that, you're way too close. That you're about to get hit by the tornado if that happens. But yes, you can often see. And you know, if you're in a a drier area, like if you were to see this thunderstorm in, uh, you know, New Mexico or something like that, uh, you'd see a bunch of dust and dirt getting sucked up into the storm as well. And that can be quite dramatic. You see these bright orange or brown trails getting sucked up into the thunderstorm. So anything around the storm that's loose gets sucked up into the storm. So be it pollen, pollution, sand, dirt, whatever's there, uh, it is getting sucked up with the storm as well as the hot, humid air. In this case, it just happens to be rain. Uh, Becky? You have a I have a, yes, I have a question. All mm -hmm. right, this one is going from left to right. In other words, updraft to downdraft, left to right. Can it go right to left? Uh, it, I guess it could if the if if you were if you were on the if you were on the other side of this storm. So if you were on the left hand side of this storm it would appear that the storm was moving the opposite. It would appear to you that it was moving from your right to your left. So it would be okay. basically a mirror image of where, you know, of how the storm would present itself to you. Is, so she, saying, is she saying, does the wall cloud move laterally along that line of general movement? Yes. I mean, the, the wall cloud will generally move towards the area of heavy rainfall. It might move a little bit ahead of it. So it might, it's going to move to the right. It might be moving a little bit into the picture sort of towards you. Uh, but again, if you don't move, the storm is generally tracking towards the right uh, from this perspective. Uh, but if you're on the other side of the thunderstorm, the thunderstorm is a complete mirror image with, with respect to you. So the storm's moving the same way. It just looks like it's moving a different direction because you're on the other side of the storm. But is there, but is there any movement at all? Uh, I mean, it's going here, it's going left to right, but mm -hmm. is there any movement towards you or away from you in this picture? Does that happen? Uh, oh yeah, certainly. And you know, that that's the problem with a two dimensional picture is you, you don't get a full, uh, a full view of where the downdraft is. And so the downdraft in this case is not just off in the distance. It is coming out of the screen towards you a little bit as well. So this tornado, while it's generally tracking to your right, it is also somewhat moving into the screen towards you. Um, but, you know, from this perspective, you're far enough away to where if you didn't move, the tornado will pass off to your right. It won't actually hit you in this case. Oh, okay, I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, at least twice in my life, I've been where uh, there were, I don't remember what they called them, it was like little tornadoes that kept uh, popping down. Um, once was in Little Rock and, and for about an hour, they would say, you know, there's a tornado here there's, and it's gone and now there's one over there and there's one over there. It was like there were multiple small tornadoes that were touching down. So how does that differ? I mean, obviously it'd have to be a wall cloud Right. So uh, not necessarily. Some, multiples. Is sometimes the if if you get random little weak tornadoes all over the place, uh, that can happen with uh, what we call landspout tornadoes, uh, and th those are those are very different than supercell tornadoes. And in, in that, those landspout tornadoes can right. never get super strong. There's no chance of them ever getting violent or destroying your house or anything like that. Uh, the landspout tornadoes develop for a different reason than a supercell thunderstorm develops. Uh, with a landspout, you have some rotation on the ground, and that rotation basically uh, gets sucked up into a thermal, that thing you see like buzzards and stuff fly up on in a, on a hot summer day. And so if that circulation gets stretched, uh, it, you know, it, it basically, it's basically just a really strong dust devil, more or less, but it's it's bigger and it's stretched out so that it's thousands of feet tall. And, you know, if you, if you get some moisture in it, you, you can actually see it, but it's, you know, it's not strong and it won't get any stronger because it's, it's not tied to a thunderstorm. Uh, I mean, I guess it's possible if you had lots of thunderstorms nearby, you could have lots of tornadoes here and there in the city. But um, for the most part, a supercell thunderstorm 
is going to be big enough that it would take up most of the city of Little Rock. So you, you wouldn't be real likely to have lots of little supercells over the city. Um, usually it's one big one. Um, okay. And maybe it, with the size of Little Rock, you might be able to fit two supercells in there, but that, you know, that, that might be stretching it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so we'll, uh, that's basically the basics for your updraft and, and downdraft. And so I, I hope you feel more comfortable visually identifying uh, those parts of the storm. Um, assuming you are more comfortable with that, we can move on to something a little more advanced. And that's look at it. How do I look at a storm and know it's a supercell? How do I know that the whole storm, the whole updraft is rotating? Uh, and in this case, uh, you know, we, we look for updraft clues first. So we look down low, we see some flat, smooth clouds. You can even see some sunshine behind it. The flat, smooth clouds down low. And then as you look up, you do see a, some cumulus clouds, but more, more so as you look up, you see this sort of spiral shape in the clouds. Uh, and so you, you're not, you don't see a big tower of cumulus clouds necessarily. Uh, but what happened to your cumulus clouds is because the whole storm is rotating, it took those cumulus clouds and stretched them out all on the outside uh, of the storm into this barbershop pole shape. Uh, and that's how you know you've got a supercell. So basically, as this air is rising, it's rotating around the thunderstorm as it moves up uh, through the updraft. And you can't see that happening because the the updraft base uh, the, or the diameter is, you know, eight to 10 miles wide or so. So you can't actually watch the storm rotate, but you can see the signs of the rotations with those distinct horizontal lines uh, within the updraft, uh, you know, within the, the cylindrical updraft there uh, that we call striations. And sometimes those striations can be really, really dramatic. Uh, like in this case, we're looking at updraft. It's, it's not raining uh, directly under here, under these flat, smooth clouds. You do see maybe a small wall cloud developing, but we look up and there's no cumulus clouds at all. But you see how these clouds are, have these distinct horizontal lines in them. That tells you that you, you're still looking at updraft. You're just looking at the updraft of a very strong supercell. The supercell is spinning very rapidly. And so that's, instead of cumulus clouds, it's, it's stretched out all around the outside of the storm, uh, sort of like putting a block of clay on a spinning wheel, right? As you smooth it out with your hands, it gets less, less blocky and more smooth. That's basically what's happening to your cumulus clouds there, except uh, there's no blocks and the cauliflower appearance gets smoothed out and stretched out into these horizontal bands uh, that, you, that we see as striations. So if you find the updraft and you look up above it and you see striations, you know you've got a supercell thunderstorm on your hands. And uh, I like this picture because it's, it sort of shows you both things happening uh, at once. You, you look down low, you see the flat, smooth clouds, you, you see the sunshine underneath, so you know it's not raining. And then as we look up, we do see those striations. And as you look up further, you can actually see that tower of cumulus clouds. So this thunderstorm has just started to rotate and you can see how those cumulus clouds are being spun out uh, into these horizontal clouds that we call striations. So this storm is just becoming a supercell. So it was a, you know, a normal updraft that start, that's right now starting to rotate and it's becoming more dangerous. And of course, it's very dark off to the right here. So you know in general, that's the way the storm is moving, sort of into the screen uh, towards the right in this case. So you're not in any danger of the storm hitting you, but look at that lightning, right? <laughs> that lightning can arc a long ways away from the storm. So even if you're not super close to the thunderstorm, you could still be in danger of being hit by lightning. A uh, lightning does not stay close to the rain all the time. It, it can arc out a long ways away from the storm. Uh, and this is a time-lapse view of uh, basically the updraft part of a supercell. Uh, and again, you can see sort of this orange clearing here to the right of it. Um, this was a supercell that was moving at one mile per hour, so it was hardly moving at all. So this person was able to take a time-lapse video of what's actually happening in the updraft, and you can just see how that whole updraft is spinning. And that area of uh, 
orange there. That's basically sunshine trying to peek through. But you see all the heavy rain, and then it's very gray down near the ground, and then very dark gray again hit, heading back into the updraft. That's all the rain going sideways and then gets getting sucked right back into the storm. And again, some of the features are blurred because this is a time lapse, but this gives you an idea of the rotation of a supercell over the course of about an hour, I think this was taken. And you hardly ever see a supercell that's stationary, so this person <laughs> just took advantage of it. Uh, that's, that's, uh, this is what happens when you have more directional speed, uh, shear than uh, speed shear. So if the winds are just blowing out of a different direction, this, it slows down the storm motion, but it still removes the rainfall from the updraft. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, so one of the things that confuses storm spotters uh, quite a bit is identifying a shelf cloud or a wall cloud. And the reason being is because in, in each one, there are low-hanging ragged clouds. Of course, they're there for different reasons. And if you remember, the shelf cloud is the leading edge of your downdraft, while the wall cloud is sort of the, the core of your updraft, the, the very bottom part and usually the strongest part of your updraft. Uh, the shelf cloud, uh, you know, if you're five miles away from each feature, uh, the shelf cloud is going to look much, much bigger and much, uh, you know, much longer uh, than the wall cloud. The shelf cloud can be 10 times as long as the wall cloud. The problem is, and the, the reason people can get confused, is if you're very close to a wall cloud, it can look like the wall cloud takes up the whole horizon, your whole field of view. So if you're too close to a wall cloud, the wall cloud looks very big. Uh, and if you're far away from a thunderstorm, the shelf cloud can look really small. And so that's how people can get confused between the two. It's, it's all about perspective. But behind the shelf cloud, usually you should see heavy rain. Uh, right underneath the wall cloud, it shouldn't be raining at all. All the air should be rising up. If you're watching it, you could see some rain get sucked into it, but you should see the rain moving up, right? Not, not down. It should look very strange <laughs> if you're looking at uh, rain moving into a wall cloud. And then the, the thing you can feel as a storm spotter, if you're looking at a wall cloud, those winds should be at your back moving towards the wall cloud. Whereas if you're looking at a shelf cloud, the wind should be in your face. Uh, again, the storm pushing winds out and away towards you. And so I'm going to show you a few pictures here and let you decide if you're looking at a shelf cloud or a wall cloud. And so this is the first one. Uh, what do we think? Shelf or wall? Shelf. Go. Yes. Very good. So this is a shelf cloud. So uh, I'll take away the word shelf there, but you can see the low hanging, ragged looking clouds behind it. It's extremely dark. Uh, this shelf cloud might not mo be moving directly at you. You can sort of see you're on the edge of the bow. So the, the bow starts here and then starts to arc around this part of the thunderstorm going back into the picture. So this storm might not be moving right at you, but again, you are looking at a shelf cloud or the leading edge of the downdraft part of that storm. Uh, okay, what about uh, this cloud down here? Wall. Yeah, in this case, this is, uh, this is a wall cloud. And some of the clues you can look for, uh, look above the wall cloud. You see those flat, smooth clouds above it, so that's where your updraft base is. Uh, your wall cloud in this case is very well defined, looks very dramatic, uh, has, a, has sort of a, you know, a bell shape to it at the bottom. Uh, but if, if you look beneath it, nothing's falling out of it, right? So you see this big, dramatic, scary looking cloud. You look behind it, it's very bright. So nothing's falling out of the clouds there. And when you, when you look above it, you can actually see those flat, smooth clouds and if you look further above it, we don't see a big tower of cumulus clouds, but you do see those horizontal lines, those striations. So we know we're looking at an updraft in a supercell, and this is the wall cloud. So if it was going to produce a tornado, this is the area we'd want to watch. And the rain is off, you know, sort of off the picture here, off to the right. But you can see how the wall cloud sort of tilts from the left towards the right down. Uh, and that's because, it, again, the storm is sucking up uh, better relative humidity, higher relative humidity air, if not pure rainfall, back up into the storm. So your wall cloud is always going to tilt towards the, uh, towards the main downdraft. And uh, what about this one? 
<laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a shelf cloud and there's no way this was Photoshop. This was 100% real. Um, <laughs> if, uh, yeah, if the elf didn't give it away, the, uh, the elf on the shelf there, the, you've got your low hanging ragged looking clouds. And again, behind it, it's a very dark, and the whole thing is photoshopped. I mean, not just the elf, but this, this storm is not approaching New York City either. Uh, <laughs> the, the whole thing is photoshopped. The storm is real, but it's a storm from the plains that somebody put in New York City and then plopped an elf on. So I just thought it was a funny picture. But <laughs> yes, this is an example of a shelf cloud. Uh, so here's what we want to look for for assessing the tornado potential uh, of a supercell thunderstorm. So the first thing you want to look for is updraft. So, um, it, you know, if you look, if you take a quick look at the picture, you know, immediately your eyes get drawn to this thing at the bottom. And so what I, what I encourage you to do is instead of just looking at the, the low hanging, scary looking cloud first, uh, try to see, do I see signs of updraft? And in this case, uh, we do, right? We see smooth, flat clouds all around this low hanging, scary looking cloud. Uh, we also don't see any rain, right? There's no rain falling out of this part. And if we look up, we see some of those striations. Uh, and we see a big column of striations leading up into the storm. Uh, so we've got lots of clues here that tell us we are indeed looking at the updraft part of the thunderstorm. <coughs> and then the next thing is, is this a supercell? Well, I, I already gave that away, but you look up above those flat, smooth clouds, and we don't just see a tower of cumulus clouds, but we see, you know, these, the sort of barbershop pole to the clouds. So we know that the whole storm, the whole updraft is spinning, and it stretched those cumulus clouds out into these, uh, you know, semi-horizontal lines that we call striations. And then once you're sure you're looking at an updraft, and you're confident you're looking at a supercell, you look for the wall cloud. And in this case, within the updraft, we clearly have a wall cloud. Uh, so you can, you can see that. And then once you've identified the wall cloud, you know what part, exactly what part of the storm might produce a tornado. So this is where, you, that's when you start focusing on the wall cloud. You know, you look at it. Is the whole wall cloud rotating? You'll actually be able to see the wall cloud rotate. The storm is too big to see rotate. But the wall cloud is much smaller, so you can actually see the rotation in a wall cloud. It won't be zipping around like a, like a spinning top. You'll see a slow rotation of the clouds within the wall cloud. And then within the wall cloud, if there's going to be a tornado, usually it's preceded by a funnel cloud. And the funnel cloud will be spinning much faster than the wall cloud uh, if you're watching it. So again, in general, if you're trying to assess the uh, tornado potential of a thunderstorm, you start at the top of the list. Am I looking at updraft? If you're confident that you are, is that storm spinning? You know, is, is it a supercell? If so, then it's more of a tornado threat. Uh, then you see, do I see a wall cloud? If so, that's a danger sign that, yes, the storm it may be capable of producing a tornado. And then you pay attention to it and see if it's rotating uh, and see if you see any funnel clouds. The only, the only way to confirm a tornado is to see debris. So once you're trying to look for a tornado, if you found the right area, you, you basically stop looking at clouds and you start looking for debris. Uh, it doesn't matter if a cloud touches the ground or not. That doesn't make it a tornado. You need to see damage and dirt and debris flying around. That's what confirms a tornado. And this is a video here showing you uh, the whole thing. Now, th again, this is where perspective matters. This guy is way too close. But it, within the whole uh, picture frame is the wall cloud. So the whole thing is the wall cloud. You are looking at updraft, but the whole picture left to right is the wall cloud. So you can see the whole wall cloud itself is, is spinning, and you can see the clouds rising up into the wall cloud as well. And then in the middle, uh, we, we can actually see a funnel cloud. And that's spinning a little bit faster. And again, this is where we stop looking at clouds and we start looking for debris. So as soon as you see debris, you've got a tornado. And so you can see all that dirt and dust spinning around underneath the cloud. That's already a tornado. The cloud doesn't need to touch the ground for it to be a tornado. 
You just need to see the, the dirt and debris. And you can see that. And again, if the tornado is around for a long time, it'll suck up enough dirt, debris, and water to where you'll see a cloud come into contact with the ground. But just keep in mind, a tornado doesn't have anything to do with its cloud. It has everything to do with the debris. Uh, and you can see the extent of this debris. It's actually much wider than the cloud. And so the, the definition of a tornado is a violently rotating column of air in contact with the storm and the ground at the same time. The definition of a tornado has nothing to do with a cloud. Uh, clouds touch the ground all the time and they don't hurt us. What do we usually call a cloud that touches the ground? Fog. Fog, right? <laughs> so you walk outside on a foggy day, that's a cloud touching the ground. Uh, and yet, you know, your house doesn't get torn apart, right? It's just a cloud touching the ground. Well, the same thing with a tornado. Uh, there's nothing special about the air in a tornado. It's rotating really fast but it's just composed of air. So it's completely invisible until there's enough dirt, dust, and water that gets sucked into it that you can see some of the tornado, but you can never see the edge of the tornado. So in this still picture here, I can see the debris and almost extends from, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but basically almost the entire width of the tornado to the left and maybe about a third of the width of the tornado to the right. So that's at least the true size of the tornado. And usually when you see a cloud associated with a tornado, uh, the, the actual tornado is anywhere from two to five times the size of the cloud that you're seeing. So if you see something like that, if for whatever reason you're compelled to want to take, get up close and take a picture, try not to get up close. You could accidentally drive into the tornado and get seriously injured uh, you know, before you, you realize you're in the tornado. <coughs> Excuse me, this video here actually happened in uh, April, I think, of this year. And let's uh, see how close these guys get to a tornado. But it's already a tornado. You can see all the debris, right? off in the distance there you can see the funnel cloud up high near the clouds okay. you can also see the funnel never makes contact with the ground yet this is a tornado the whole time right you saw the incredible amount of damage being done at the ground uh, again once you see the updraft supercell wall cloud funnel cloud stop looking for clouds start looking for debris that's what will confirm a tornado for you there's a what direction does a tornado rotate in? Uh, typically a counterclockwise rotation. Um, a, a tornado is actually too small to be impacted by the Coriolis force, which uh, is basically the, uh, you know, the, the implied force or the effective force of the rotation of the Earth that the rotation of the Earth has on the atmosphere. 
um, it's not a true force, it's just a relative force. At any rate, uh, the Coriolis effect, it affects something, it affects things on large scales, like really big low pressure systems that take up, um, you know, a, cover a state, for instance. Um, and so the rotation of the earth makes that low, big low pressure system uh, spin in a counterclockwise direction. Also makes high pressure uh, you know, systems, at least in the northern hemisphere, spin in a clockwise direction. Uh, with low pressure, uh, we tend to get, uh, with low pressure systems, we tend to get warm fronts and cold fronts and dry lines. So we get thunderstorms developing closer to low pressure systems and not high pressure systems. So uh, you're basically, your, your storms are more likely to rotate counterclockwise because they develop closer to a low pressure system and the way the winds are aligned is affiliated with that low pressure system. However, uh, a, a supercell thunderstorm itself is also too small to be affected by the Earth's rotation. So there's nothing that says you can't get a clockwise rotating supercell that produces a clockwise rotating tornado. Uh, they Many have been reported, uh, but it only accounts for about 2% of all tornadoes. Uh, and usually the... Um, we, we call them uh, usually left movers when a supercell splits. The left, the left mover is spinning clockwise. When it produces a clockwise tornado, it's usually not nearly as strong as the counterclockwise tornado uh, you know, that's produced by the, the main supercell or the right mover. Um, so it, it, is, it is possible to have tornadoes spin clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, but because low pressure systems spin counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, most tornadoes, you know, indirectly, uh, that causes most tornadoes to spin counterclockwise. Thank you. Yes, no problem. I, that was probably a longer winded answer than what you wanted. But <laughs> uh, Okay, you, so, yeah, sorry, go could, ahead. Could you explain what, what's the difference in the tornado that looks ropey versus one that's more amorphous, that's broader? It, is it just a matter of debris? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's partially a, a matter of debris, partially a matter of uh, how high, or, you know, how high the humidity is, how close the rain is to the tornado. Uh, if the tornado moves over water, it can suck up water and therefore look broader. Uh, a tornado that looks ropey throughout its entire lifetime uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's weak. It just means it, it usually didn't come into contact with much water. And so you, you see the, you can see the funnel cloud that looks very ropey in nature. Um, but you know, that you may not see it touch the ground at all, or you just, you see the debris. And in the last video you saw that the cloud never really touched the ground at all. It was always just debris, but and that was very close. I mean, that person was very close to a tornado. Uh, so the, the shape of the cloud generally doesn't have anything to do with the strength of the tornado. It, it has more to do with, um, how much junk got sucked up in the tornado, and very specifically water. Uh, water condenses and, and forms a cloud very quickly as, as, as it is lifted up, um, whereas, you know, dirt and dust, it doesn't, you know, it just, it just flies around. It doesn't really change form. Uh, you know, water, uh, as it's in its uh, vapor form, you can't see it, but as soon as it condenses, all of a sudden you can see it, and so uh, that's what makes a tornado look bigger, is if it has a lot of water uh, inside of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so, if you guys do see something, uh, we'd love we'd love to hear from you, of course. And so, this is how you can report to us. Uh, that's our one eight hundred number, uh, specifically designed for storm spotters. Uh, if you go to our webpage, uh, you can. There's a but. There is a button down at the bottom of the page where you can submit an online report. Uh, and again, you can find that at weather.gov forward slash LZK. That's, that's our, your local weather service page here. Uh, you can use social media. You can contact us on Facebook or Twitter. If you mention at NWS Little Rock on Twitter, that'll grab our attention. It'll send an alert for us to look at your tweet. That's a great way to share pictures with us. Uh, there's a free app you can download on your phone called MPing. Um, and I'll go over that here in a second. And also, if you're part of a ham, ra ham radio club or group, a lot of times ham radio operators are storm spotters, and they'll work uh, with a team or a net of other ham radio operators 
uh, to report storm reports back to the Weather Service. So if you do see something, uh, that's great, but it's really important that you tell us what you see, because if you don't tell us what you see, we can't relay it to the public, and then you, you can't contribute to helping save somebody's life if we don't get the information. Uh, so again, at the bottom of our webpage, uh, it, submit storm report. I'm not gonna go through the whole form with you. It, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's got all the directions there. Just fill out all the fields and hit submit. Uh, and that'll get a report directly in front of one of our radar operators. Uh, if Again, Facebook, at NWS Little Rock, either on uh, Facebook or Twitter, uh, that's a great way to share pictures with us. Uh, you can't call us up and share a picture with us, but you can certainly tweet us and share a picture with us that way uh, if, if you have a, a picture you want to share. Uh, Mping, uh, this is the app that I was telling you about. Uh, you can look for it. I think it's on the the Apple store or the Android uh, store. It's, it's free to download. It was developed by the University of Oklahoma and the National Severe Storms Laboratory, uh, mainly to collect precipitation types for uh, dual pole analysis when our radars were upgraded to dual polarization. Uh, but now it's used more for storm reporting. So if you open the app, it basically uses your GPS location to tag your location and then you can just tap on the screen whatever you're observing. If it's hail, wind damage, a tornado, uh, you can tap on your screen and that report will go out to the whole world anonymously. We'll have no idea who you are, but we'll know where you reported whatever it is you're reporting. So that's, that's one way to get a report to us as well. Uh, if you do call in a report, uh, we, you know, we always want to hear from you. If you're wondering, should I call this in or not? I would say call it in, right? If you have any question, call it in. Uh, but this, this is how we, you know, ideally we'd like to communicate. Just tell us, you know, I'm a trained storm spotter and then give us your location. This person happened to be in Benton uh, at the intersection of Alcoa and military. And then tell us what happened. I saw a golf ball size hail at 6.55 PM. That basically gives us all the information we need to make an official report and an official record of what that storm did at that location in that community. Uh, and that's important for a couple of reasons. For one thing, golf ball size hail sucks, right? It hurts. So anybody downstream of that, we want to let them know there's golf ball size hail that's been observed. Watch out. Don't be outside. Uh, you could get hurt by this storm. The other reason is, is it makes an official weather record of that severe weather for your community. So, you know, if two years down the road, if you realize that your roof was damaged by hail that occurred in May of 2020, uh, the insurance company is going to go to the official National Weather Service record to see, well, is, was there hail during that time or not? And if you didn't report it, there's no official record of it. So uh, th these records are used for lots of things. We use them to help keep people safe, but, uh, you know, the data is free for anybody to use. So the insurance industry uses them. The research industry uses it for many different methods. Uh, so again, if you see something, report it to us. And this is about a 30 to 45 second conversation. It can be, you know, once you give us a report, we can say, thank you very much. Please stay safe out there. And we've got the record. Uh, and this is a not so great way to report something you see to us. Uh, we got some really heavy winds here not too long ago. Uh, what's missing in that type of report? Location and time. Yeah, yeah, location, time. No uh, detail. And yeah, there's no detail at all. We, we don't know what heavy winds are. Not too long ago is relative. We don't know what that means. Yeah, if you call us, we don't know who you are, where you are. And if you tell us really heavy winds, we don't know wh exactly what that means. So, you know, if, if you call us, we just, we, we'd like, uh, like you to have all the details in mind beforehand. Definitely always call us, but, you know, we also want to talk and be efficient so that we can talk to lots of people. Um, you know, the, this bottom thing, it results in questions back and forth. It takes a 45 second conversation and makes it a three or four minute conversation. So we don't want to do that. We want to talk, but we want to talk efficiently. But don't ever be afraid to call us. If you see something, it's always safe to give us a call and we're there 24-7, 365. So how do you describe wind? <laughs> uh dis how do we how do you oh, describe like, wind like oh describe you know, heavy wind. wind light wind uh instead of trying to describe the wind i would report the damage 
So if I basically, I wouldn't report on the winds unless I saw the winds damage something. So if it blows over your fence, or if you see it blow down a big tree limb, or even uproot a tree, uh, that's what I would call in. I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call in a, an estimate of the wind speed. Unless you have a device that's measuring the wind, if you have a home weather station and it reports the wind speed, you can always call that into us. Uh, but otherwise, I would just call in damage. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, okay, so things that we want you to observe and, and report to us. So if you see any of these, uh, you know, wind damage, hail, a tornado, uh, or flash flooding, uh, these are the things that thunderstorms can produce that hurt people. So we definitely want to hear from you in all of these instances. Um, of these four things, what do you think kills the most people uh, each and every year? The flooding. <laughs> The flooding. Yep, absolutely. So uh, tornadoes probably get the most media attention, but the flooding is by far the most dangerous uh, aspect. Uh, a lot of times people die in floods, uh, not because the flood caught them by surprise, but because they, their, you know, their route home or their normal uh, route, that wherever they're going, is covered in water. They don't want to turn around, so they drive right through it because they think they can make it, and then they don't. So most people that die in floods, they choose to drive into the flood and that costs them their life. So uh, that's, you know, obviously we don't want people doing that. We hope through education that someday people will stop driving into flood water. But I, you know, we can't control everybody's behavior. So all we can do is hope education helps. Uh, in 2019, pretty, pretty average year for severe weather in Arkansas. Uh, 33 tornadoes, uh, zero fatalities. That's where we'd always like to see that number. That's a good sign that the warning system is doing something, that it's working. Um, we had 40 reports of uh, hurricane force or greater winds. Uh, and so more reports of hurricane force winds are greater than tornadoes. And that actually resulted in a fatality. I, I think that was due to a, a large tree falling on a house where somebody happened to be at at that time. Uh, we had... It wasn't a real big year for large hail, but we had four reports of two inch or greater hail. And we had one piece of giant size hail in Southern Polk County, uh, Vanderbilt, I think, uh, 4.6 inch diameter hail. That's, that's just massive. That, that won't just damage your shingles. That'll go through the decking of your roof. Uh, that will do quite a bit of damage if it moves over you. It's very rare, but when it happens, uh, it does an incredible amount of damage. Of course, we had hundreds of reports of flash flooding like we do every year. Oops, and that uh, resulted in the uh, most fatalities as, as well. And we had two indirect injuries from, uh, or two injuries from indirect lightning strikes as well. So again, lightning is a big threat and, you know, does cause injuries and fatalities at times as well. Uh, estimating hail size. Uh, what we want you to do if you're estimating hail is while that hail is falling, to run outside, grab it, and measure it while it's falling. Okay, no, that's, uh, that's what we don't want you to do, actually. We want you to stay in your house and estimate the largest hail that you see. So it's not worth ever putting yourself in danger to get us a storm report. You can visually estimate how large the hail is and call that into us. Uh, when you report the hail, we just want to know the biggest hail that you can see and the reason why we want to know that is that's probably the hail that's causing damage. So, uh, you know, if you imagine driving down the road and you're getting hit by thousands of pieces of uh, penny sized hail, it probably doesn't damage your car. You might be driving slow, but one piece of baseball sized hail hits your windshield and that thing craters your windshield. So it's usually just the few pieces of very large hail that do most of the damage. So, report the largest hail to us, and uh, that's what we'll use as the official record because it's probably representative of the damage caused in your community. And here's a video here, and uh, you can take a guess at what the largest hail is.
Okay, so lots of stuff going on there. What do you think the biggest hail was? Just the single biggest hailstone. Quarter size? Yeah, I would say, yeah, there were quite a few quarters in there. Absolutely. The, the biggest hail only showed itself for a very brief period of time. It was actually on a table. It had bounced up and landed on one of the tables there. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of it was quarter size or smaller. There was a ton of it, but it, most of it wasn't that big. Uh, but golf ball was the single largest piece of hail uh, in, in that video. Of course, if you're getting that many quarters, uh, that, that matters as well. Uh, it's, there's a big difference between getting you know, some small hail and a ton of small hail that, you know, obviously a, a lot of small hail can still do some damage, but golf ball was about the biggest size out of all those hailstones falling. But again, just estimate the largest hail you can see safely from inside your home. Don't go out there and try to measure it. Once the storm passes, if there's still hail there, great, then you can measure it, but wait until the storm's gone. Uh, and if you do still find some hail when the storm is gone, you can pick it up and put it in your hand and send us a picture. Uh, but if you do so, please put something in your hand next to it so that we have something for reference. Everybody has different sized hands, so if you just put hail in your hand and take a picture, we can't make a record out of that because we have no idea how big your hand is. Uh, so uh, a quarter is one inch in diameter, so if you put a quarter next to a hailstone, we know that we had to make a record for that because we issue severe thunderstorm warnings for one inch or larger hail. So we have to keep a record of all reports of one inch or larger hail. Uh, or of course, you could take a tape measure and measure the hailstone. And if you send us a picture with hail in your hand with you know a measurement or some object next to it, this could be your hand that's famous in 2021 Skywarn. <laughs> awesome, right? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so estimating wind speeds is uh, extremely difficult. Um, I, you know, I've seen meteorologists that have been at the job for 20 years. They struggle to estimate the wind speeds, and that's just because we don't experience high wind speeds very often, especially here in Arkansas. Maybe if you live in Amarillo, maybe that's different because you see 40-mile-an-hour winds 100 times a year, but it just doesn't happen very often here in Arkansas and in, across most of the United States. So again, instead of estimating the winds, just report the damage you see. If you report the damage to us, we can correlate that back to a wind speed and get a pretty good idea of what happened. And pretty much the idea of the warning system, we want to issue a warning if the winds are strong enough to do damage. So if that happens, we're supposed to issue warnings for 60 mile per hour or greater winds. But if there's a storm coming by doing 57 mile per hour winds and knocking down trees, well, it's still hazardous, right? So we probably should have a warning out. So uh, in this video, you can, there's no audio with this. So don't, you know, don't worry that, that something's broken. But it, when you watch the video, you can uh, think about, are the winds strong enough? Do we need a, war uh, should we have a warning out for this situation? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks pretty clear. <laughs> and it really makes you question this person's uh, <laughs> decision-making ability. <laughs> Why, I don't know, what would possess you to go outside in a storm with howling winds like that, with the rain going completely sideways, but... She did, and it makes for a funny video, so there you go. <laughs> as far as I know, she doesn't get hurt. She just sort of tumbles uh, in the rain. She gets real wet, but outside of that, she doesn't get hurt. But yes, that was uh, probably an example of about 65 mile per hour winds. So that's near the bottom threshold of what we're supposed to issue severe thunderstorm warnings for. So what you saw there were some of the weakest winds that we issue warnings for. So again, if we issue a warning for strong winds, don't take it for granted. I know it's not a tornado. It can still hurt, though. Uh, okay, so is it a tornado? So from everything we talked about, about what, you know, what constitutes a tornado, remember the checklist. You start with updraft, then supercell, then wall cloud or funnel cloud. Uh, and then you stop looking at the cloud and you, stop, you start looking for debris. Uh, debris is what confirms a tornado, not a cloud. So in the top picture... Is it a tornado or not? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to see, but there's cl uh, clearly a funnel of dust on the ground directly beneath the funnel cloud. So yes, this is already a tornado. 
there's nothing there to destroy. Luckily, it's just out in the open plains. Uh, but yes, you can certainly see that dirt and dust being picked up by the tornado. So yes, that's a tornado. Uh, and the bottom picture, keep in mind, this was a picture taken from Conway a couple of years ago. Uh, Low-hanging, scary-looking clouds are not always tornadoes. Uh, in this case, a tornado was reported to us at least five or six times in Conway. We didn't issue a warning because on radar, we already knew what was happening. Uh, the thunderstorm had collapsed and was falling apart. So what you're looking at here, is, it's kind of weird, but you're looking down radial of a shelf cloud. And so the low-hanging, ragged-looking clouds are sort of down a line, so you can't see all of them. But you, you can see one of them, and it's blocked by that highway sign. So by gosh, that looks like a tornado is touching the ground in Conway. But what don't we see? Debris. We don't see any debris, right? So even if it looks like a cloud is touching the ground, you could call in and tell us, I see a cloud, you know, touching the ground or looks like it touch, touches the ground, but I don't see any debris. That's the important thing. And in this case, there was no tornado. It's just a low hanging cloud associated with a dying thunderstorm. And all that was observed in Conway were 20 to 25 mile per hour winds. So imagine if we had issued a tornado warning for that, right? A lot of people would have been pretty irritated <laughs> for us issuing a tornado warning for 20 mile per hour winds. Well, that so, doesn't even look like it has rotation. No, it, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't at all. It's, there's no updraft at all. The whole storm is dead. It's, it's all downdraft clouds. There's no signs of updraft at all. So you're right. It, uh, it fails the very first part of the checklist, right? There's no updraft. <laughs> so if you knew that, you would know not to be scared by this. But a lot of times people just look at the thing that is scary. And that's, you know, as a storm spotter, it's natural. That's human nature. But as a storm spotter, hopefully you take a step back and look at the whole situation. Does this make sense? Do I see updraft? Is it a supercell? Is there a wall cloud? Are there any flat clouds around this thing at all? And if not, you know, this, you might be looking at outflow or downdraft. And in this case, yes, it was just a dying thunderstorm. Uh, so a tornado life cycle, as, as we've discussed, a tornado can look very different uh, throughout its life cycle, just depending on where you see it uh, and how much stuff it is sucked up. So in this case, uh, all of these pictures are from the exact same tornado, just at a different time during that tornado's life. So at the beginning, again, you see this uh, very distinct rotational signature in the clouds uh, in the top left. Uh, and then you look at the cloud down to the ground. It's not even obvious if the cloud is touching the ground. But we know it's a tornado because the debris, the debris right? And in you can get a sense for how big this tornado is. Look how wide the debris field is. This is already a huge tornado. It's a quarter mile wide. And all you see is that little rope of a cloud touching the ground. Uh, right here, you know, when, it, when the cloud starts to bend, you do get a little worried that the storm cold air might be pushing through the tornado or something. So you do get a little worried that uh, this tornado is falling apart, but that wasn't the case here. Uh, as this tornado continues, it sucks up more and more stuff, more and more water, more and more dirt. And you can just see the, the cloud keeps getting bigger and bigger through time. And the tornado gets a little bit bigger. It gets to be about a half mile wide at its biggest, but not much bigger than how it initially started. And that's the deceiving part about tornadoes. And again, the cloud doesn't define the tornado, but the debris field does a better job of doing so. So the width of this tornado is at least double the size of the cloud that you see touching the ground in this case. Of course, at the end, uh, all tornadoes end almost the same way. Uh, cold air eventually comes all the way around the tornado and, you know, chokes it off, cuts, cuts the gas away, right? Cuts the hot, humid air, prevents the hot, humid air from feeding that tornado. And then the, the tornado will spin down and eventually, you know, get undercut by cold air and dis, uh, dissipate. However, remember what I told you as a piece of something that's rotating, as it gets squeezed, it's spinning faster, right? Uh, and so on this last frame here on the bottom right, you have a tornado, but it's completely surrounded by rain. So this is what we would call a rain wrap tornado. Is it still dangerous? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's very dangerous for many reasons. For one thing, it is a little bit smaller but because it got smaller, it's spinning even faster. 
So even though it may not be affecting as much people, whoever it's hitting, it's probably doing the most violent damage that it did at any part during its path. Uh, this most tragically happened in Joplin, Missouri, where a tornado, as it was approaching the city, it became rain wrapped right on the western edge of the city. Uh, and it stayed rain wrapped as it moved through town and then the tornado dissipated shortly after it left town. Well, that was bad for several reasons. One is it intensified from an EF2 tornado to an EF5 when it hit the city because it got squeezed, got rain wrapped. Uh, and then another, people couldn't see the tornado, so they had problems believing that the warning was real. Many people never took shelter, and if you don't take shelter from an F5 or an EF5, you are very, very likely to get hurt. So you've got to take action. You, and we don't know how big it or strong a tornado is going to be based on radar. Uh, you know, if there's a tornado approaching, you just have to take shelter and hope it's not a bad one, right? We, we assess the damage afterwards. We don't know live how, how much damage the tornado is doing unless somebody has told us. But when it's rain wrapped, it's dangerous because you can't see it. And if you're a person that wants to go in and help folks, you know, try to pick up the rubble, get people out of uh, danger, wait until that storm has passed. If you drive into that thinking the tornado's gone, you could accidentally drive smack dab in the middle of a tornado and become a casualty yourself. So if you see a tornado become rain wrapped, make sure that whole storm moves away before you go in and try to give people help. I mean, helping people is admirable, but it doesn't mean a thing if you make yourself a casualty. You can't help anybody if you hurt yourself. Uh, and, you know, if you're out there as a storm spotter, it's always important to maintain situational awareness. Uh, you know, don't be this guy, basically, right? Big tornado, not paying attention, still mowing the lawn <laughs> with a very big tornado in the background. Uh, if there is a tornado approaching, these are your basic safety tips here. Uh, basically, if you can get to an approved storm shelter or get below ground level, uh, you can survive just about any tornado. So those are your best two options. Uh, the tornado wind speeds below ground are zero miles per hour. Uh, the tornado winds can't go underground because the ground is much more dense than air. So if you can get underground, your chances of surviving a tornado are, are very, very good. Unfortunately, here in Arkansas, we don't have many basements. So basements aren't a normal thing in houses here in Arkansas. So a lot of times getting below ground or getting to a FEMA approved storm shelter is not an option. If that's not an option, get inside your house, the most central room, put as many walls as possible between you and that tornado and that maximizes your chances of getting through the tornado without getting hurt. And you can see the young man in the picture here, he was home alone, yet he survived this tornado without getting hurt at all because he knew where to go and what to do when it mattered. I knew exactly where to shelter. He did it before the tornado struck. This was an EF3 tornado, and look what happened to his house. It's gone, right? It's totally demolished. Uh, and this is the ideal situation. I mean, we don't want people's homes to get destroyed, but if a tornado is going to hit you, it's just going to happen. We want the walls to absorb the damage so it's not hitting you. And that's what you want the walls of your house to do, is basically to protect you from the debris in the tornado. It's the debris in the tornado that hurts and kills the most people, not just the wind by itself. Uh, the only caveat here is if you're in a shelter or in a house where the wind can get underneath your structure or your house, it's not a safe place to be. Uh, and it's not has nothing to do with the quality of the home. Uh, mobile homes or manufactured homes can be built to an extremely high standard of, uh, you know, high quality build. But if air can get underneath that structure, a tornado does damage in two ways, violent rotation and violent suction off the ground. So if air gets underneath your extremely well-built manufactured home or mobile home, it's still going to get lifted up in the air. And it may not get lifted far compared to the size of the tornado. It might only get lifted 50 feet in the air, let's say. So if, if it goes up 50 feet in the air, then comes back down, in the scope of the tornado, you didn't get lifted very high. But if you think about it, what if you jumped off of a five-story tall building? What would happen to you? You're probably going to be a pancake, right? So if you get lifted up in the air in a tornado, your chances of survival go down really, really fast. So 
you know, if you're in a shelter where the air can get under you, that's not a safe place to be. You want to find a better shelter before the tornado gets there, if it's possible. Uh, things that look like tornadoes but are not are usually when a thunderstorm is collapsing. Uh, we call these things microbursts or downbursts, and they are associated with very localized, strong and damaging winds that don't last very long. So when you see it, I mean, this top left picture, if this was a tornado, oh my God, right? That's like a mile wide cloud headed for uh, the children's uh, medical center there. But it's not. Again, you, you look at the first point of the checklist, there's no updraft here at all. It's all downdraft, all low hanging, ragged looking clouds. And this is just a big ball of rain and wind hitting the ground and spreading out. The weird thing about it is, is if you're right in the middle of it, you don't get any wind damage at all. You just get soaking wet. If, if you're right on the edge of it, where the winds start to spread out along the ground, that's where you get the localized damage. So if the microburst is right on top of you, typically nothing happens. You don't get damage. But if you're on the edge of it, you get damage. And I'll show you what happens at the edge of a microburst here in this video. Whoa. And so, you know, this, this wasn't a tornado. This was a microburst. This was, the, this was the impact of a dying thunderstorm, right? A thunderstorm that collapsed nearby the school. And, and I hope it shows you a couple of things. Microburst can do a lot of damage. You saw how quick it happened. It didn't last very long, probably 15 to 20 seconds, uh, but it still did significant damage. The other thing I hope it teaches you is never, ever, ever shelter your kids, or if you have any say in it, shelter yourself or your children in a gymnasium or in any place that has very tall walls without any lateral supports. If you happen to be in church and your sanctuary has a large, has, is filled with very tall walls without any lateral supports, that is a terrible place to be in, in a thunderstorm or a tornado. You would want to evacuate in a school to the hallways to where you don't have those tall walls or in a church. Churches usually have other rooms where they teach kids or there's hallways where you can get into. It's much safer to be in a place with small walls than it is very tall walls. Those tall walls catch the wind just like a kite, and they're very easy to, uh, to fail when the wind puts pressure on them. So again, microbursts can do a lot of damage, and just because you can fit a lot of people into an area does not mean it's a safe shelter. And be it schools or churches, uh, you don't want to be in a gymnasium. You don't want to be in the big sanctuary in the middle of a dangerous storm. Uh, if you are going to be a mobile spotter, please keep in mind that what you see in the movies is not real. So this is the movie Twister, and I actually like the movie. It's not very scientific. The tornadoes are, are all faked, and sometimes they're not faked very well, but it's a good, exciting movie. There's, there's a nice storyline behind it, and it's action-packed. But all those tornadoes are on a green screen, right? So Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton aren't actually running away from uh, debris in this huge EF5 tornado bearing down on them. They're just running in front of a green screen. So... You can't be that close to a tornado and not get hurt. Look at all the debris flying around them. It's not realistic, so please don't do that. Uh, if you are going to drive, if you're going to be driving as a storm spotter, have somebody else in your vehicle. Uh, if you're driving, what is your number one responsibility? Safety. Yeah, drive, right? <laughs> Keep both hands on the wheel and watch the road. So if you're driving, uh, your responsibility is driving your car. If you're sitting there looking at your phone, checking radar to see where you are with respect to the storm or trying to look at your GPS to navigate where the next road is so that you can find the storm, you're just as dangerous as a, dr as a drunk driver. Distracted driving is illegal. So have somebody else in your car help you navigate, help watch radar, call in a report, take pictures. Uh, you know, if you're driving, do your job and just drive. Drive your vehicle safely. Keep your vehicle uh, safe on the road. Most storms are not going to kill people, but a distracted driver is way more likely to kill people. So do the responsible thing. If you're driving, focus on driving. Have somebody else in the car help you with the other stuff. Uh, if you are driving, and even with a buddy, uh, don't core punch. 
And if you're not familiar with the term core punch, that's all right. But it's basically a thrill seeking uh, behavior where people intentionally drive in the middle of a thunderstorm to find out what's there. You can do it and you'll find out what's there and you won't like the results. So don't do it. <laughs> uh, large hail can easily destroy your windshield. Uh, strong winds could blow you off the road or blow trees down on top of you. Uh, not a good idea to core punch. Uh, if you are, if you happen to be driving and spotting alone and you want to pull off the road to take a picture, check radar, uh, navigate, make sure you get all the way off the road, right? If you park halfway on the road, that's very dangerous. Cars behind you might hit you or you're forcing cars behind you on the incoming, uh, oncoming traffic. So if you do pull off the road, get all the way off the road and don't be a, uh, again, don't be a hazard yourself. And if you get out of your vehicle, generally, it's a good idea to keep your vehicle running. If you've got your phone, a ham radio, a laptop computer, all plugged into your car and it's not running, guess what happens to that battery? It's toast, right? And then when you want to get out of there, uh, choo -choo -choo, there's, no, there's no getting out of there. So either keep the vehicle running or make darn sure you unplug everything before you get out of that car and stop it. Uh, other storm spotter risks, of course, lightning is a risk with all thunderstorms. And keep in mind, we don't issue warnings for lightning. So you're not going to get an alert from us saying that there's lightning nearby. It's your responsibility to look. Uh, if you hear thunder, if you see lightning, to go inside or get inside your vehicle and wait until the, the storm has passed. Can I ask a question about lightning? Yes, of course. You know, we, we tell kids, uh, you see the lightning, then you count. Yes. That tells you how far away the storm is. Is that true? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there is, there is some truth to that. And approximately, if, if you can count seconds accurately, approximately if you see lightning for every five uh, seconds, uh, you know, that basically until you hear the thunder, uh, you count up all the seconds and basically divide by five. And uh, that's how many miles away that lightning strike was. Hmm. So if you counted 15 seconds before you heard the thunder, it was three miles away. Um, so you're right. Uh, I mean, light travels significantly faster than sound. Uh, even though sound travels at 700 some miles per hour, light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So <laughs> light always wins that battle. But uh, usually if you hear the thunder, the lightning, is, uh, the lightning is a lot closer than you think. The counting thing does work. And again, it's approximately a five second to one mile ratio. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and you know, the, I think the Arkansas Athletic Association probably has some of the best guidelines for it. Basically, if you see lightning or hear thunder, stop what you're doing outdoors, postpone the game, wait until 30 minutes until after you see the last flash of lightning or hear the last rumble of thunder before you start the game again. That's a really, that's really good code for uh, youth sports. And I think it's a really good code for people in general. Just stop what you're doing outside. You don't have to do anything special. Just go inside and watch a show or something, right? When the storm's gone, then you can go back outside. That's it. That's what we can do so that we don't get hurt. And, you know, lightning's not always going to strike the tallest thing. Uh, oftentimes it does, but not always. In this case, you can see lightning striking the beach despite many other tall objects, all, you know, all around. Uh, and this video shows you the power of lightning. It goes by pretty quick, but uh, you don't want to take a direct lightning strike, I guess, is the moral of the story. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm in this class at the moment, but I'll just keep on about so you can see if the lightning does that to a power pole, imagine what it can do to a person, right? <laughs> uh, if it's powerful enough to completely demolish a power pole, uh, you're not going to survive it. I'm not aware of any case where somebody took a direct lightning strike and survived. Many people have taken indirect lightning strikes and survived, but a direct lightning strike is... I would say it's almost impossible to survive. The temperatures are hotter than the surface of the sun, granted just for a fraction of a second, but it, it's uh, 50,000 degrees Celsius. It's just, it, it's not something you want to be a part of. <laughs> and if you're nearby, you can get hurt and, and still survive. But again, 
You don't want to be struck by lightning. Being in, being in your car is perfectly fine or being indoors. You just want to have some sort of shell all around you uh, so you don't get hit by lightning. Uh, if you do happen to be driving in strong winds, uh, well, this is a funny example of what could happen. Luckily, nobody gets hurt here. So you, you get the idea there. Strong winds that can knock high profile vehicles over. So if you happen to be driving in a severe thunderstorm near a semi truck that can be blown down on top of your car very easily, that guy somehow saved it. I have no idea how he saved that thing from toppling over, but he did. Uh, other things that are commonly knocked down trees and power lines. So you could be driving and a tree or a power line gets knocked down right in front of your car. That could obviously lead to an accident. So again, don't drive in, a, in the middle of a severe thunderstorm. Uh, flooding, as I mentioned, is, is the number one killer. And I've already described that flooding kills people mainly because they choose to drive into a flood. And that's what ends their life. They just don't respect the power of water. Water is incredibly powerful and driving into it is always a bad idea. So we try to teach folks, turn around, don't drown. But uh, of course, I've, if I had a video for everything else, I have a video showing you of somebody making sad choices. Uh, this person happens to be driving a school bus, unfortunately, that's making sad choices. Now they're gonna come up to a road here and the road, I guess is technically not barricaded, but there is a sign there that says road flooded ahead, that orange sign on the road, which the bus drives past. And you can see signs that it's rained very recently, right? Obviously the, the roads are still water covered. It hasn't evaporated yet. Uh, up here in a little bit, you'll see a tree limb, small tree limb that was down. That sign says low water crossing. And there's the little tree limb. So it rained pretty recently, probably a pretty good downpour. And then here's the flood. And you could feel for the person if they were moving real fast and couldn't avoid it, but they stop. They see it's flooded and then choose to drive into it. And you can see how swift it is. Exactly. And this, this is how people die. Th these are the choices they're making. They think my big heavy school bus, there's no way that can get knocked off the road. Water will knock it off the road. And then once you're downstream, you know, you're, you just have to hope either you wash up against something, you got to hope you don't go underwater. Cause if you do, you're probably not going to survive. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what puts people's lives in danger. And then it's not just the people in this vehicle that's in danger. What about all the people that go to rescue them? The swift water rescue people, anybody else that sees it, a good Samaritan that tries to jump in and save them or something. All those other people's lives are in danger just because you made a terrible decision. So don't drive into a flood. Even if it's inconvenient, turn around and save yourself and everybody that might rescue you uh, and don't drown. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll see if I taught you anything here. Uh, for this type of cloud, uh, what would you report? What do you see? Chalk cloud. Chalk cloud. No. Yeah. So in, in this case, yeah, you're looking at a, at a shelf cloud. You've got some low-hanging clouds, uh, very turbulent uh, behind it, a very big wall of just dark rain. And so this, this indicates that storm is pretty much moving right at you. Um, I, I don't know that it's necessarily a super dangerous storm. It doesn't look very big, but it is a shelf cloud and it's moving towards you. So if you don't move, it's about to get a little windy and you're going to get wet. Uh, what do we think here? That's a wall cloud. No. Yeah, you, yeah, you definitely have a wall cloud here. Um, what else do you see? It's it's an updraft. Yeah. You've got yeah. a wall cloud. And it's a superstorm, isn't it? And it's a supercell. Yep. So you can see those striations. So you know the updraft is rotating. And you look underneath the wall cloud, and what don't you see? No rain. Not, not raining, right? Nope. So that's that's one of our clues for an updraft. It's not raining. You look above the wall cloud, you can see that area of flat, smooth clouds. And then the wall clouds, that big blocky thing right in the middle. That looks like an ice cream cone. It does, yeah. 
uh, a very dangerous ice cream cone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, and in this picture, uh, what do we what do we see happening? I see a tornado. Yeah, there's there is a tornado. That's for sure. So in in this case, this updraft is absolutely huge. Um, there's actually two tornadoes yeah. happening. Uh, this tornado, guess what's happening to it? It's becoming rain wrapped. Mm -hmm. So this tornado is going to go away. And while this tornado goes away, there's still updraft over here that's not rain wrapped. The next tornado has already developed on the other part of the updraft that's not rain wrapped. And this can happen. This is what we call a family of tornadoes. So as one tornado dies, the next tornado develops and takes its place. And we can see this happen over and over again. If the cold air is not enough to cut off the entire updraft, in this case, the cold air only went through half of the updraft, this half of the updraft will go away, will die, but then it'll just shift over here and that'll become the new updraft. So yeah, in this case, you have two tornadoes. And if you had been watching the tornado on the right for a long time, but you were under the updraft, tornado number two could come right down on your head without you knowing it. Uh, tornadoes don't make a roaring sound until they have debris in them. So there's no warning sign if a tornado drops down on top of your head. So occasionally, if you're out there storm spotting, it helps to pull one of these and just look up, right? <laughs> make sure you're not about to become part of tornado number two. And then this is the last one here. Uh, what do we see here? See a wall cloud. Yeah, there, there could be a wall cloud there. Are, are we looking at updraft? Yes. Yes. Yes, for I'm sure. You can, you can see the Tower of Cumulus clouds there. Uh, what do these things uh, represent? What about below that Tower of Cumulus? That would be the striations. Yep, you've got the striations. So you know you've got an updraft, you've got a supercell. You might have a wall cloud developing there. This person's actually relatively far away, so it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, but you definitely have a strong updraft and a supercell. Um, Bonus question is, which way is the storm moving? To the left. To the left. From your, from your perspective, the storm is moving to the left. If you wanted nothing to do with this storm and wanted to get away from it as quick as possible, which way would you drive? To the right. To the right. If you've learned that, you've learned enough to stay safe, and that's well worth the class time. <laughs> Uh, so that's that's really all I've got. Uh, I appreciate you spending your afternoon with me learning about storms. I always enjoy teaching them. And, you know, if you do see something, please tell us. Uh, you are a very important part of our integrated warning system uh, that helps keep people in Arkansas safe from dangerous storms. You, we need to hear from you while the weather's happening to keep people safe. Uh, if you want a certificate uh, for this course, uh, you can uh, write down this web page here. It's uh, weather.gov forward slash LZK again, um, but then it's just another slash, and then it's a spot cert, all is one word, uh, dot htm. And when you click on that link, uh, you'll see there'll be two links there. Uh, so this was the, the normal or standard class. So if you click on the link for the basic storm spotter certificate, you click on that, it's going to download the certificate for you. And it's just a Microsoft Word document. So you should see the Microsoft Word file at the bottom left-hand side of your screen when it downloads. Um, when it does, to open it, you just need a password. And the password is exactly what's written here in the, in the, you know, in the big yellow letters, Skywarn 2020 with the exclamation point. And the case does matter. So that capital S is important. Uh, everything else is lowercase than the 2020 exclamation point. Uh, once you put that in, it'll open up the document. And then in this, if you print it off, you will have, it'll say you have two hours of storm spotter training. Your name here will get credit for that. Um, if you would actually want yourself to get credit for that, I would highly encourage you to type your name in there instead of leaving it your name here. Otherwise, you will literally print out a certificate that says your name here has completed storm spotter training. <laughs> so uh, you can type your name in there in that yellow field. And that's, uh, that's all the proof you need of uh, taking, taking the class that you took today. And uh, there's my contact information. My email's down there at the bottom. Uh, that phone number uh, is our 24-hour phone number. The 
501-834-0308. Uh, you can call that or the 1-800 number that I showed you earlier. Uh, either one of those will, will come into our operations area and you get to talk to a, a meteorologist. Um, you know, so again, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, we never turn off our phones. We're always there to, to answer the phone. And if you have a report to take your report. So there's always somebody there, no matter what. Um, we're not all working from home. I'm certainly teaching this class from home. I'd like to be teaching it in person with all of you. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't get the opportunity to do that, but um, all, we still have meteorologists at the office monitoring the, you know, the, the best equipment that we have, especially if we need to issue warnings. So call us if you need to. And that's all I've got. So thank you guys. One quick question. Yeah. Um, it seems like when 